We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, recording this on a Tuesday morning this week, so we're all over the place from week to week. But hey, the podcast gets made. That's what matters. It's almost afternoon here, so it depends on where you are. That's true. Finished Iron Fist Season 2. Oh, wow. It was really, really good. Okay, good. I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. That's... I was, I was like... Why wasn't this the first season of Iron Fist? It's so much better. You know what they did, which I have not done yet, uh, I think, in a Marvel movie, is they had a single... Well, actually, a Marvel series. I think Daredevil season one, there was only one real villain. There was that... It was really just Fisk in the first season yeah, of Daredevil. Yeah, it was yeah. really just Fisk. This one, it was really just the one guy. Oh, okay. The whole time, yeah. which was great. Now, well, I guess Jessica the, Jones' first season. I mean, it really was just Purple Man. It wasn't. Yeah, that's true. It wasn't really that's anybody true. else. So all the good seasons, basically, yeah. Yeah, just one, one hero, he, one villain. They square off for the entire season. There yeah, there was a little bit of a dip. I think around uh, episodes two or three. Always seems felt, to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I kind of felt like with Daredevil season two and some of the other ones, like that's like like right in the middle. It would just like okay, this is the part where the hero gets so beat up that they can't fight. Right. Anymore. Yeah. We have to take yeah, a so, couple episodes off. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. Right. And, then, and and I'm like, ah, oh, here we go again. And the same sort of thing happened here, but a bunch of other stuff happened that was important. Right. Unless you're you know, the Punisher and you enough. dislocate your shoulder in episode eight, and then. Just carry right on. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Walking it off. But yeah, real good, real good season. The big reveal at the end, I thought was. I, I, first of all, I didn't get it at first. I had to go look up what they were talking about, and then once I got it, I was like, "Yeah, it's still stupid." Okay. I, so I thought it was stupid when it happened. And it's I still think it's stupid. But so the big. Well, I'm know, still series is is behind on those yeah. shows. I, I haven't even finished the second season of Jessica Jones, and I'm, I'm watching them in order. I'm not going to skip ahead, so oh. I, I got a ways to go. I was a real big fan of that season. Yeah. Uh, I still want to watch I'm, it. I'm, I'm working on Luke Cage season two, which That's, I'm, I'm liking. I also have that, that to go, yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, this is at AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. Get your questions answered. All you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You can go to www.avrant.com and leave us a comment there. Facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Uh, don't leave a comment. I mean, you can leave a comment at YouTube, but we're just going to ignore you because you Very likely. I don't know. Face- I respond sometimes. Facebook is good, though. We, we respond yep. on Facebook. Uh, you can contact us directly. Rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Still regret that Twitter handle. <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. Right. Well, at, at the time, I made that one. And I, met, I made at avrant underscore Dina. That's right. So that's why that happened. Uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week. To become a listener of the week, you have to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. That will take you to a PayPal donation site. So we want to thank Iris for going to PayPal and leaving us a donation. Those monies will go into our coffers to help pay for hosting fees and other such things. So thank you very much, Iris. Yeah, Iris, thank you very much for that donation. We appreciate it. We also want to thank our 72 mm-hmm. patrons over at Patreon.com. Patreon.com is a service where you can sign up to, for a monthly donation that is taken from your account and sent around to whatever content creators that you want to, uh, I, I, would, I would say, employ. It's sort of a salary. <laughs> so you are employing them to make content I don't content want to think of it that you. way. That, that implies like we, we are beholden to our, our patrons, which we, we feel indebted, we but but we, we are not. That's true. We, we, we're, yeah, we're not salaried workers. So That's true. You are so donating. It is a donation, yeah. for sure. It's just automatic yeah. every month. So 72 pa- people have signed up for that service, including Bradford. So thank you, Bradford. Yeah, that's uh, patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up. We are 
over 70 patrons now. 72 is most definitely is squarely into the over 70. It's true. That, that yes, is. and this this podcast is not in any way supported by the M&M Nestle. Ah, the M&M M&M cup this. mug is back. There you go. The M&M cup. It's the big, I, okay, we have three large mugs in this cat. Uh-huh. This is the second largest. The largest gotcha. one is dirty. Bradford, so. thank you for very, very much for being a patron. We appreciate that. And thanks so much to all of our 71 other patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast. Did you enjoy the NES Classic and SNES Classic mini consoles? Sony seems to have noticed how well they sold, and other rather than being like Nintendo and just not sell them anymore, not making anymore. Look, they all sold out. Yep, that's that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's all we were gonna make, anyways. <laughs> they they did bring it back, but like a year later. So. So they're releasing the PlayStation Classic Mini Console for $100 on December 3rd. It will have 20 generation-defining games. Battle Arena Toshiden better be in there. I don't know. That, that was like the whole reason I bought that console. <laughs> I, bought, I Somebody had imported one to a game store in um, San Francisco where I was living. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were playing Battle Arena Toshiden or whatever it's called. I think that's what it's called. And I was, I lost my mind. Mm. I was like, 3D graphics, like I, I mean, you know. Probably doesn't look as good as you remember in no, your No, I played it recently, actually. PlayStation <laughs> it's, 1. It's, it's uh, but it, that is a generation-defining game as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Uh, the full list of games has not been revealed as yeah. of yet, so we'll see. Yeah, uh, Final Fantasy VII, that's, that's on there. They, uh, they, they said that for sure. As, no. as would be expected. Uh, yeah. I'm hoping Parasite Eve will be on there. That was probably my favorite first PlayStation game. But uh, who knows? That wasn't made by Sony, so. Yeah, maybe not. But, I mean, neither was Final <sighs> Fantasy. <so. laughs> yeah. Back in 2012, Samsung started selling, selling TVs that could be upgraded with an evolution kit so that you could replace the processor and upgrade the HDMI inputs without ever having to buy a whole new TV. I am sure at the time, back in 2012, I scoffed at such an idea. Hmm. Because I always scoff at such an idea, and I wonder why. <laughs> they promised to keep their TVs cur- via the uh, optional evolution kits until 2016, but the last evolution kit that ever came out was released in 2015. Mm-hmm. So I guess they said, yeah, it's close enough. After 2016, they stopped the whole evolution kit uh, program entirely, but a bunch of complaints in Europe, most mostly Norway, didn't know those guys were so angry, but maybe they're just cold, were enough to get Samsung to release one final evolution kit now in 2018 for 300, 300 euros. Yep. Which is about $300 anyways. But uh, so is it, what, HDMI what? It's uh, So it's nothing to do with HDMI. They didn't add any HDMI ports with it. It's right. pretty much just the processor with their new streaming platform. That's that's what you get. For 300 bucks? For or you could spend euros, yeah. $30 and get a Chromecast. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. done. Seems, seems. But, but they're like, hey, you said till 2016, you were a year short, and I, I guess to avoid the lawsuit, I don't know. They're like, yeah, here you go. You want it? Here it is. <laughs> Pony Knock it up. up. You can. We made five. <laughs> you can. You can talk to. I don't even know if you can talk to Bixby. That was going to be my joke. If you, know, you can talk. I don't even know if that. I didn't notice them say Bixby was in there, so that might not even be it, which would be even more hilarious. What's Bixby? Bixby That's is- their voice assistant. Everybody has to have their own, you know? So Samsung's voice assistant is Bixby, and nobody uses it. <laughs> yeah. So. Speaking of voice assistants, Amazon decided that the world needs a whole bunch of new Echo devices and their voice assistant in pretty much everything, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> Dude, my Eco B has Alexa in it, and that sure. stupid thing answers me all the uh, time when I'm not talking to it, and it irritates me. <laughs> and the e- other Eco B says that the... It'll tell you what temperature it is in the house, mm-hmm. but it, it, if you ask it to change the temperature or whatever, it'll say it can't connect to the other yeah. one and that they, it's, it's disconnected. I'm like, I've actually asked it, like the, e- yeah. the Amazon that's inside of the Ecobee to tell me what temperature it is in one of the other, on one of the other sensors. It's like, no, the Ecobee is not connected. I'm like, I am talking to you, you idiot. So you're aggravating. Anyways, so the six-inch, hundred and thirty-dollar Echo Sub lets you upgrade a couple of Echo speakers in a two-point-one setup of uh, sound quality garbage. Six-inch uh, sub sub <laughs> subwoofer in air quotes. Yes. Yes. Uh, thirty-five dollar Echo input has no speakers of any kind built in, and it's basically Amazon's ac- answer to the Chromecast audio. The two hundred dollar Echo Link and thirty watt, three hundred dollar Echo Link amp are pretty much the answers to Sonos Connect. Yeah, it's actually uh, sixty amp. watts per channel there for the, for the what Echo, I say Echo Link amp. You said thirty watts because there's all the th- oh, all the threes all along there's there. A but, lot of threes uh, everywhere. Yeah. Uh, there's an Echo Auto for your car's dashboard, oh, dude. 
don't even get me started on that. I mean, you listen to any podcast where they talk about she who shall not be named, yep. and your car would be going off like I crazy. I know. <laughs> Because they do that all the time. I've actually seen stre- like YouTube streamers will be like, they'll stop their stream and the you know they'll stop their game, and then you know to answer a que- to ask a question of she who shall not be named. I'm like, dude, stop it! <laughs> You're kind of killing me. I mean, the fact Anyways. that we can't say her name on the podcast shows how popular the thing is. Because we can talk oh, yeah. about the the Google Home Assistant, we can talk about Cortana, we can talk about Siri. We're not worried about setting them off, but the the, the one that starts with an A. Can't it's, say that it's, one. It's like, the, remember how Netflix was, a, it still is in everything, but remember how when it first started getting into everything, we were making the jokes about I was in the toaster and everything? Mm-hmm. That's what, Alexa is well, literally going to be in your toaster. Th- yeah, the, the last one will definitely, yeah, you'll like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so the, there's a dot in the car dashboard, eco smart plugs, and even the microwave to connect to your eco devices. Now, a microwave? Now, the microwave doesn't actually have microphones built into the microwave, but you connect it to your other, de- you know, other echo devices, and then it, it will, you can control it with your voice that way. Uh, same with the smart plugs. They don't actually, I thought the smart plugs for sure were going to have <coughs> microphones built in. I thought that was the whole point. It was like, okay, now every electrical outlet is just listening to you. So no matter where you go, I thought that was the idea, but apparently no, it, it connects over your Wi-Fi network to some other echo device, so. It's, so it's just like, a smart plug you can control with the voice. Uh, I might not. I might not hate that. I yeah, might want that for a smart day plugs. Season, all right, with you. Yeah, getting right. into the whole home automation. But yes, uh, yeah, echoes everywhere. A hugely confusing lineup, but sort through it. If you want to plug it in and talk to it, they got something now. All right. And uh, I came across a news article. Imperial Audio has introduced an add-on super tweeter, much to my dismay. Yeah. It looks like it's a ribbon super tweeter with adjustable crossover points from 6 to 15 kilohertz. Uh, it, I think it plays down to 2. Is that right? So, yeah, so there was some mention of that in there, yeah. yeah but but the put- crossover, the lowest crossover you can give it, according to the, the little write-up that they had, was 6 kilohertz. So it is yeah. a, a super tweeter. That's You're not crossing over to your mid-range driver at 6 kilohertz. No, you're not. So this is they're like, I mean... I don't know. I don't... I, this is silly. And I mean, the write-up that they have is... I mean, when you talk I, about super it, tweeters, it's, it's not like, April Fools, right? It's not I, April it's Fools. Not. It, it feels can't be. like it. This it is, feels like it. I mean, okay. So what? What was my favorite line there? Like it was. It was talking about feeling the treble sound pressure. Feeling like very specifically the word feeling the treble sound pressure. I'm like, if you are feeling sound pressure from sound waves that are above 20 kilohertz, which is what a super tweeter is for. Wow, like that, your ears will be bleeding long before you feel it. I guess that's how you would feel it. That That is a terrible thing to have written up there. I don't know what their marketing department was thinking, but uh, yeah. Uh, they're thinking that the people who buy these things aren't really knowledgeable about how sound works anyway. So, I mean, uh, I mean yeah, clearly it's and... for the, the high-res audio people who are like, I've got to have stuff above 20 kilohertz. How much is this thing? I don't know. Who can Don't buy it for one. Oh yeah, don't ever don't don't buy that. Yeah, it's frequency garbage. response two thousand to thirty thousand. That's it. It only it goes up to thirty thousand hertz. That's what, it, that's what it says. It's an extra ten. It's a half an octave. That's they it. also talk. They also talk about this about how as high as the, the, that that uh, high res digital files have audio frequencies as high as a hundred kilohertz. That's right. What is but the point of this but, thing? Was a th- th- but we're only going to 30 because you can't even hear past free- 20 they anyways. They didn't even give like, uh, the, the, the response, uh, just frequency response. Yeah. They didn't even give a plus minus three decibel point. What in the... Don't buy this, folks. I don't know what they're doing. I guess they're throwing it out there to see if it sticks, but this is... Not happy about that. That's a dumb product. There is an off. Yeah. For the crossover. <laughs> so you can do six... Six crossovers or off. <laughs> or off. Off. So, so it's, that, that'll go down it to responds two kilo, down to two kilohertz. kilohertz. I have no idea how much it's rolled off, but it was, oh, man. But their big claim to fame is that they have a phase knob, I guess, is the deal. Because so that yeah. you can better integrate it. Is that right? Well, no. like we talked about, you can have phase misalignment in a crossover, and now you're going to have a. There's a no new... phase knob on this thing. What are they talking about? I don't. Who cares? This is so. We There's don't no we don't phase. like it when companies that we like introduce products that are really dumb and this is really dumb. This don't is get quite, this. This is quite bad. Yeah, yeah. Don't get this. Uh and you know what you know what makes me I don't know what, it always bothers me whenever somebody cuz it, it it makes me it makes it more difficult for me to recommend them. Like if, That's right, yeah. 
you know, if, uh, you know, SVS started selling, I don't know, I mean, what could they sell as a, uh, or spiked feet for their subs? Sure. I'd be like, that would, that would. That's well, I mean, I'm not even opposed to selling spiked feet. There's a place for spiked feet. It's if you claim that it's decoupling it. Yeah. Then yeah, I'd yeah. be, but that's uh, that's marketing. So it could yeah. be fixed, but yeah. I don't know. All right. So the HGTV <laughs> test posted their video about the new JVC 4K uh, projectors, and Vincent Tio confirmed that they've sped up the HDMI handshake. So yes. there we go. He made a point of mentioning that. So uh, that was a question from last week. We had no idea, but he has seen them in person. They are still pre-production bottles, but he's like, I asked them specifically about it because people complain how long it takes to do your HDMI handshake. And they're like, yep, it's faster now. Didn't say exactly how much faster, but it couldn't be any slower. So <laughs> two, two milliseconds. Faster. Yeah, really. It definitely could not be slower. So uh, yeah, that's good to hear. Hopefully it's on par with most other devices at this point. All right, let's get into these questions. Mm -hmm. Mike, this is from last week. I think the only question we had was from last week. Mike has been framing and wiring his home theater himself. He's got two kids, so the process has been uh, slower than he would have liked. But it's almost ready for drywall now, so he wants to solidify his wiring before he closes up the walls in the ceiling. Mike is a fellow who already owns some ELAC debut speakers, and he wasn't sure if he wanted to try mounting them on his walls as surrounds and surround backs. And he also wasn't sure whether he wanted one pair or two pair of side surround speakers for his two rows of seating. Mm Mm-hmm. He wound up buying six pairs of Focal Superbird on-wall speakers. His wife would prefer the speakers to be hidden, so he's building acoustically transparent columns, and the Superbirds will go inside. Yeah. Since he will have two side surround speakers for, on each side, he should wire them in series, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. Yeah, He's powering everything off an AV receiver, so if right. you wire them in parallel, you could basically take their stated uh, impedance and cut it in half, half if you wired right. them in parallel. Uh, whereas four ohms. It'd be four ohms in this case. Uh, uh, whereas if you wire them in series, uh, you can basically add the two impedances together, which will be 16 ohms in this case, which is perfectly fine. Look on the back of any AV receiver, it'll say it can drive. Usually it'll say between 6 and 16 ohms is the most common numbers that you'll see. Yeah. So uh, having them wired in series is the way to go. So there's a slight issue. He hasn't 100% decided how far back he's going to put his second row of seats. And he'd like to be able to nail that down after the room is finished and he can play with the sitting location at that point. So he can run speaker wire from his receiver, which is outside the theater uh, in a separate room. Mm Mm-hmm. The location for his first row, that much is nailed down. But then he need to get a speaker wire from the fr- front row column to the back row column, and a wire from the back row column all the way back to his receiver. Correct? That is correct. Yeah, that's how that's how a series wiring would go. But I've got a good mm-hmm. idea for how how to achieve this without uh, without a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he will have trim around the columns and baseboard trim. So it would be okay to figure out the wiring after the room is finished and just use the trim and to hide the wire runs. Yep. Yep. That'll work just fine. Yeah, this this, this should be fine. So what what I would have you do is uh, you said your your front row position is nailed down. You know where the front column for that side surround speaker is right. going to be. So run your speaker wire from your AV receiver in your separate room to your front column position where the the first side surround speaker is going to be. But make that wire super duper extra long. Leave a whole yeah. bunch <laughs> of extra length because right. the way this is going to end up being is that the, let's just say, red wire from the AV receiver is going to go to the red binding post of your first surround speaker, the one that's in front. But then the black binding post on your AV receiver is going to go to the black binding post of the second surround speaker that's at the back. And then there's just going to be one wire that goes from the red binding post of the back, like the side surround speaker that is farther back to uh, where the second row is. It's going to go from that black binding post, uh, or did I get that backwards? From the red binding post on that one to the black binding post on the front side surround speaker. That's true, yes. yes so you got it right. if you just run one regular pair of speaker wire to the front section, but you leave it extra long, now you can clip the red end so that it's the proper length for that front one, but you'll have the extra length left over that it could run yeah, down. Yeah, probably the- want to like triple it triple the distance yeah. you think i mean make need. sure it's it's extra yeah. extra long because speaker wire isn't terribly expensive so right. yeah it could run down the uh the side trim of the first column through the baseboard and then up the side trim of the second column and connect to the black binding post of the second right. speaker as long as you've left that length then you just need one wire that goes from the red binding post of the 
one that's farther back, goes down the trim, along the baseboard, up the trim, and connects to the black binding post of the side speaker that's towards the front. So you can definitely hide, like you're essentially hiding two wires behind yeah. trim. That should be fine. And uh, yeah, as far as running it right now, you just have to run it to the front one, but to leave a whole bunch of extra length so you can run the one black wire from the front column to the back column. And that's it. Should be fine. Yes. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So he's got four Atmos speakers laid out, mm -hmm. top front and top uh, rears. Should he maybe run wires for top mills as well? They need to have the option for six overhead speakers. Any value to this, or should he just stop at four overheads? I mean, dude, you got it open. Yeah. <laughs> speaker wire is cheap. Yeah. I'd go ahead and do it. Uh, I would make sure that those top middles, uh, you want to optimize them for your front seats. Oh, yeah. That's going to be your main Well, yeah, seat. we, because we, he was questioning where to install his top fronts and top rears. And we were like, just optimize it for the front row of seats. Because yeah. he was like, yeah, the back row is not getting used as much anyway. So assuming you've already done that, then uh, as well, top middles. And now I would yeah. say it's, it's maybe a little questionable because, of course, there's a whole range where your top fronts and top rears could be. Sure. If they're, say, four and a half or five feet in front of you and four and a half or five feet behind you, uh, then that leaves a pretty good spread between front and, and rear, uh, in yeah. which case top middles would make sense to me. Now, if you've only put them three feet in front of you and three feet behind you, and they're, they're really so. only six feet yeah. apart, then top middles maybe don't make quite as much sense. So I would, I would question that a little bit based on how, how much of a spread you have between your fronts and rears, but given... Yeah, everything's open. Now is the time to run speaker wire for sure. And there are options for having six overheads. Now you could have a Denon X8500. You could have a Marantz Pre-Pro, you know, their, their uh, 8805. Or you've got that Emotiva that is supposedly coming out November 15th. We'll see if that RMC we'll one actually comes out. But there are options now that are, uh, I mean, they're expensive, 4000 or $5,000. But within the realm of possibility that you might eventually have one. So, yeah. Oh, is there a limit to how long of an extension cord he could put on the, on the Odyssey microphone cable? With his receiver in a separate room, he's a bit concerned about running the auto setup. Hey, man, if it works, <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's not going to be a... Because, uh, I mean, when you plug in the microphone, mm -hmm. it immediately sends your receiver into the Odyssey calibration. That's right. So if you plug in an extension and then you plug it into your microphone, and it doesn't automatically go into auto and it's not working because <laughs> you need right, a shorter right. extension. I don't, I don't think it'll be a problem. Uh, be. I, I mean, I, this is not a Sometimes people worry signal. like, oh, I've like, increased the length of the cable, so will it get the timing right? Uh, it's traveling nearly the speed of light. So uh, there's a considerably <laughs> faster than the speed of sound. Not a problem as far as that goes. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fine. Uh, yeah, the, the one thing I would caution you to do is make sure that the extension cable you get is a mono 3.5 right. millimeter uh, extension because a lot of the ones you'll find are stereo and that yeah. might not work properly. The, the, the little the metal bits don't always line up properly when you get a, a stereo 3.5 millimeter instead of a mono. So make sure you get a mono but other right. than that, should be and fine. I, I mean, you should be able to run as long as an extension yeah. as you need. So he wants a super black, uh, deep black levels and high contrast of a JVC projector and he wants lens memory. But of course, mm -hmm. JVC just announced their new 4K projector models and suddenly has a new lineup too. Mm -hmm. Should he stick with his plans of getting a JVC X790 or should he consider one of the new genuine 4K resolution models? And How much you money always... you got? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> you should always consider it. I mean, I would consider it. Even I would at least take a look at it and see if it, if it fits within my budget. And if it doesn't, then I'd say, okay, and then no. But if it does fit within your budget... I mean, it sounds like for the HDMI handshake alone, it might be worth getting <laughs> oh, yeah, the one. Yeah, there is that, the faster <laughs> HDMI handshaking. I mean, I will say on the Sony side, uh, he specifically said he wants lens memory, which means you can't get the entry-level model, the $5,000 model. Um, what is it now? That's the entry-level model? $5,000? Well, for, for genuine 4K. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. It's uh, $5,000 is their least expensive. Now, I think it's... Oh, shoot. What's the model number now? 295ES, I think, is the brand new one they just announced at 5000 And there was the 285ES from last year. That was $5,000 as well. Those ones don't have lens memory. So that for that feature, that wouldn't work. You'd have to go up to their, what is it, $8,500 one, the next step up. That's the... the Five or six ninety five? No, I'm forgetting the model. I think it's the six ninety five is the brand new one they just announced, but they're up in the eight or eight eighty five hundred dollar range. It's getting pretty pricey there. Now on the JVC side, 
Uh, you do have lens memory and all that in their least expensive model, which is $6,000. <laughs> That's their least expensive of the brand new genuine 4K ones. Uh, that would be the NX5 in their lineup or the uh, RS1000 if you're on the JVC Pro side. Uh, so yeah, that does have the lens memory, but now it's $6,000. And that one doesn't have as high native contrast as the X790 does. To get similar native contrast as the X790, you have to go up to JVC's $8,000 NX7. So either way, if you're wanting the genuine 4K with the same high contrast that the X790 offers you, and you want lens memory, you're talking about over $8,000 which seems pretty pricey, but I mean, hey, it's going to be a really nice projector. On the other hand, the X790 is now available for $4,000. So it's half the price. Yeah. You're know, doing man. the wobble <laughs> version of 4K, right? It's a 1080p panel, but they're wobbling it to give you the pseudo 4K. But it gives you the really high contrast. It gives you the full DCI-P3 color because it has the color filter to give you 100% of DCI-P3 color if you want it. It's got the lens memory, so... For four grand, I'm like, yeah, that's uh, that's that's the way I'd be leaning. The I guess if the 30 second long HDMI handshakes bug you to no end, and that's worth four thousand dollars to you, uh, <laughs> then there's that. But it's to me, it's hard to argue against the X790. All right. Yeah. So these suggestions on the easiest way to sell is Elac speakers, since he definitely won't be using them anymore. He made a post on ABS forum, but nobody wanted to pay for shipping. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I, I'm not surprised at that. I I mean, AudioGon is, is kind of like the go-to online yeah. resource for yeah. selling things. But really, in the case of uh, lower dollar items, mm -hmm. Craigslist. Absolutely. You know, or or even eBay. Go. But I mean, yeah. Craigslist, you're not even paying anything yourself to list it, basically. I mean, I would just post I mean, I'd post it on Craigslist. And, yeah. You know, and the ELAC and, speakers and... are like popular enough and yeah. inexpensive enough that... Yeah, I, I think they would probably sell. I'd, I'd, I'd try that. I mean, but for honestly, sure. I mean, I, I'm not sure. I mean, if you're thinking about spending $8,000 on a receiver, I don't know how much this is going to offset that cost. And do you have a friend or a family member who doesn't have home theater who would right. benefit from Yeah, because Elex are nice speakers. I like those this is, speakers. This is a way of maybe uh, spreading the infection of home theater, <laughs> getting somebody <laughs> else the bug, as as they say, because I, uh, I would consider just giving them away now if you don't want to believe me i understand i've given away lots and lots of speakers because i i, I can't sell them but uh and i don't want to but uh you know that's just another another yeah. option there yeah craigslist and audio gone if you don't do that that's that's yeah. what i'd recommend all right boshko boshko asked previously for battery backup and un uninterruptible power supply models that you could add to his apg apc g5 power conditioner I have both not had enough coffee, and I've had just enough to make my mouth kind of... A little jittery. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm balance out here. Once he started researching the models, we suggested it seems like the battery units could do everything the G5 already does. Plus, they have a battery. So is his G5 doing anything the battery backup would it do? Should he just sell his G5 and replace it rather than adding to it? The answer to that question is 100% yes, I think, <laughs> to be honest with you. More I don't or really less, especially if you're going yeah. for a J25 or a, yeah. or a J35, which actually does more than your G5 is already doing in yeah. addition to the battery in that the, G, the this J35 is a, has voltage regulation, which your G5 does not. A perfect example of uh, a question that we answer because it, of, it, because it was asked, but the real, the real answer is something different you know, the, <laughs> no i mean and the, they don't and people don't always realize that they're like i want to do this thing and then you're like oh just get a new receiver no i don't, I don't want to get a new receiver i want to do all the, I, I want to do it this other way or like okay well do it this other way it costs more than a new receiver <laughs> but yes you can do it in this other way or, and this know, is a lot more power of plugs to plug in yeah in really, the case. but yeah the, and this is another one of those situations where it's like i want to just add a battery backup for this one thing but the solutions basically to that also negate everything else I, I already have <laughs> and people don't often want to hear that so we a lot of times we just answer the question but in a lot in this case if you're if you're going for battery backup mm -hmm. you know unless you are running out of outlets there's almost no reason to keep the g5 if you're going to get another one of the uh 
the higher end JVC, right. uh, a APC, I almost say JVC, APC models. I'm have some more coffee. There, there are a couple of things. So like your G5 is rack mountable, and maybe that's sure. the very reason you got it, is that it has the rack ears. So there's that. However, most racks allow you to install a shelf so that mm -hmm. you can put something in there that doesn't have rack ears. So a J25 or a J35 would slide right onto a rack shelf, no problem, because they're the same size as pretty much any other component. They're about the same size as your G5, a little bit taller. I believe. Uh, but yeah, if, as long as you can install a shelf in your rack, then that would work just fine. Uh, the other thing is that the G5, it does have nine outlets because it has eight on the back and then one on the front. Okay. Whereas the J25 and J35 both have eight outlets. They don't have an outlet on the front. But the G5, all of the outlets allow the full 15 amps of your, uh. of your wall outlet through. Whereas on the J25 or the J35, they have two outlets that are labeled as high current surge only, those are not connected to the battery. Those two outlets allow the full 15 amps through, but the other six outlets on the J25 or J35, those are connected to the battery and those only allow 12 amps through. Now, usually that's no problem because your television is never going to need the full 15 amps. Any of your component devices like your Blu-ray player or your cable box or whatever, they're not going to need anything close to the 15 amps. It's really only your high-powered audio amplifier or your subwoofer, and those we don't want connected to the battery and voltage regulation anyway. We right. want them connected to surge only, so that usually works out just fine. But I don't know. Maybe you got four or five devices that for some reason might need the full 15 amps. That could be a reason to keep the G5. But I think both all those things that the G5 offers, I think, are unlikely necessities. So I would, yeah, replace it with a J25 or a J35 if you want voltage regulation. Yeah, lastly, he asks, with this G5, does it protect its equipment in any way when the power goes out, or is it only doing something while the power is running? Well, it should protect from surges no matter what. That's I mean, right, yeah. It, it, I mean, that's kind of what they're for. So, you know, that is a passive ability. Now, the rest of the active stuff that it needs power for, you know, if it's doing any sort of voltage regulation or, it's not, you know. It's it, doing power like, filtering. So, of filtering, course, that yeah. would only be active yeah. when the power is running. Uh, so, but the, the rest of it, it has to, I mean, in, to be UL certified, it's got to be yeah. able to take a surge, no matter if it's got power going through it or yeah, not. Yeah, so like you had a blackout, then lightning strikes somewhere near your place, probably isn't actually going to, I mean, they say it protects against lightning strikes, but that's that's always a bit of an overstatement. <laughs> if yeah. lightning hits your house, <laughs> pretty much nothing is really going to save you, um, but you know, a surge comes along during a blackout or the, when the power kicks back on. And sometimes there's a big surge that comes through yeah. your power lines when the power kicks back on. It will protect you against that, but so will a J25 or a J35. They, that's the same thing as far as their surge protection goes. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously the one with the battery allows things to keep running during a blackout for some amount of time, given how whatever the battery capacity is and how many things you have plugged into it. Uh, so yeah, that, that'd be about it though. Yeah, last night it was crazy. Lightning storm here. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like I, I I went to the climbing gym last night with my son. I'm like, we got to get in fast because I mean there was lightning striking all in this <laughs> rain in this water everywhere. I'm like, we got to get out of here. This is crazy. I was surprised that that we didn't lose power or somebody didn't lose power, but it was nuts last night. And it had me thinking about this question too because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, Carl. Carl says, with Movie Pass having all sorts of problems, what do we think about other theater subscription services? In particular, what about Cinema? Cin Cinemia. Cinemia? It's like cinema, but spelled with an S instead of a C, and then Mia instead of Ma. Cinemia, anyway. Sounds like sin and enema stuck together, which is <laughs> never... I don't know why they chose... Do, do people not focus group these names? You know, it really irritates me when I, get, I see a Put it name. into the search engine. Anyone else got this name? Nope. Great. We're grabbing it. We're good. Cinemia, whatever, who recently announced an unlimited plan for $3 per month. <laughs> they did announce it, but... Uh, yeah. uh, let me time. tell you what I think about these movie servers. These things are, for now, much like that... Remember there was the little baby antennas all over the place? What was that <laughs> service called? Aereo or something uh, like yeah, that? Yeah, Aereo. That was right. Yeah, where they said they had the, the dime-sized uh, antennas. What a... Yeah. Yeah. And everybody was like, everybody's like, this is too good to be true. This is too good to be. They're never going to make it. The, you know, the, uh, I know like the, the local theater, the AMC theaters, whatever. Now they've yes. got their own things and stuff like that. And that's the only one I think you can That trust. is, yes. Yeah, so that is the AMC uh, Stubbs A list, $20 yeah. a month for, now I think they, what is it? 
three movies per week you're allowed to see on that one Man, which i mean if you actually time. use that you're way ahead because they don't limit yeah. you can go to any you can go to their dolby cinemas on that you can go to their imax theaters on that it's all the same price so yeah the amc stubs a list i'm like a-okay with that now they said if you sign up for a full year they lock in that price which means they're definitely thinking about raising the price at some <laughs> point which they would have to they would yeah. have to um i mean the only way they make money is if you sign up pay every month and then just never go to the movies because even if you went to two movies, they're essentially behind. Um, you know, I guess. Well, you went to one I, movie, they, that's not where they're making their money, though. They're not making it on. Yeah, they want you in the theater to buy. They their want you in the theater and stuff. Yeah, the and it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, well, Stubbs A list. I'm all in favor of now. Cinemia. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, there was this announcement. It was only last week, and they're like, we're bringing out an unlimited plan. It'll be $30 a month. Like, MoviePass dropped their unlimited plan all the way down to $10 a month just so they could try and hit their 1 million subscriber thing, which they did. Then they went completely defunct. Everybody left. They completely changed the plan. They're like, well, now you can only see two movies a month, and we select which ones they are, and they're not movies anybody wants to see. Hey, keep giving us your $10 every month. Like, they went nuts. MoviePass is insane. But Cinemia is like, okay, we're doing $30 a month, unlimited. They announced this whole thing. They're like, oh, maximum of six movies in a day, which I'm like, does that even fit? I Like, is the movie theater even open that long? <laughs> I was going to say, let me six six movies in a day. If, if, there was, <laughs> if you could hop from one movie to the other. Like if they, and they perfectly were, they lined were all, up, yeah. They were all 90 minutes long. That's, that's, right. that's still, but, I mean, what is that, like it's three hours for two movies? So that's, yeah. uh, that's nine hours of movies a day. I mean, they you should be able to fit that in. They're usually open till 10 p.m. But not even a week later, you go there now, that plan isn't there. There's no unlimited plan mo anymore. Now there is a 30 movies in 30 days, one movie per day for $30 a month. That's the one they're offering now, a movie a day. I don't know what happens in February, but, uh, you know... They, you only have to pay $29, $28. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. But in any case... <laughs> If you go there next week, it'll be different again because it, the thing is, I tried Cinemia. I never actually went to a movie on Cinemia because they never sent me the membership card after three months of waiting, even though they charged my card immediately upon me signing up. So sure. I did manage to get a refund by the only way you can get in touch with anyone at Cinemia, which is via Twitter because they don't respond to their emails, they don't respond to their contact form, and they don't list a phone number. And if you look up their address that they have listed in North America, it's just a dummy place. It's just a P.O. box. So yeah. they don't really exist in North America. Um, yeah, I wouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole, sorry to say. I mean, I you will say... You already touched them. You already touched them. I gave it a try. I mean, I will say they didn't completely rip me off. I got my money back. I'm happy about that. So I won't say that they're a 100% scam. But I mean, I get, like I said, go there next week. Their plans will be different. Their plans are different every single week. Mm. And now they're like, yeah, we don't really do the membership card thing anymore because that wasn't really working. So now you just go through our app. And if you look at the reviews of anyone using their app, they're like, yeah, it says on their app that you can buy movie tickets in advance, but uh, it doesn't work. Um, so like, just no AMC stubs, a list. If you, if you have access to an AMC theater, I'll give that a thumbs up, but anything else I, I wouldn't recommend. I mean, if you want to try, I mean, when I signed up, they're like, yeah, we have monthly plans and yearly plans, except none of the monthly plans were available. You had to pay for a full year in advance. Now they've got monthly plans listed again. I guess you could try it, but then they're like, if you sign up for a monthly plan, we have to charge you a, a setup fee, an initiation fee, which is like $30. Yeah. I was like, just on that. Just uh, no, don't do it. <laughs> I got. I was at a, uh, a, a embroidery place for my for the the climbing business, and I just picked up my so a bunch of shirts I had done. It came out really nice, but I was noticing that they had a sign up. It was like, oh, because of the blah blah blah, we now have a minimum of a hundred dollars. Okay. Hundred dollar order is the minimum for some whatever product they were talking sure. about on there. They're like, if you want, if you want less, there's a fifty dollar less than minimum fee i'm like this right. puts you over the minimum immediately <laughs> yeah, it's 50 bucks. i guess if you're ordering 20 dollars worth you're, you're coming if you out want one ahead. shirt <laughs> we, right we will make it for you but it will cost you 50 dollars plus the cost of the shirt all right nathan nathan says looking through the specs of the new iphone models in ios 12 it appears as though native support for flack files has finally been added for those who don't know flack is a free essentially format to for uh uncompressed or well comp file size compressed right. but not uh, uh bandwidth or whatever compressed yeah it stands uh, for free lossless audio codec that's what flack stands for so it is a lossless compression so you know uh 
Apple's got their own, the yes. Apple lossless, and you know, wave files are of course lossless yeah. as well. Oh, wave files micro- are uncompressed. Yeah. My- Microsoft does Microsoft have their own? I don't remember they them having their own. Not that I can recall. I can't remember. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, it appears as though the native support for FLAC files has been added to whatever. Do we have any further information regarding FLAC file support and under what circumstances it can be played back on the iPhone running iOS 12? No. I do not. <laughs> I do not well, own an iPhone, and I'm not going to own the iPhone. I'm not interested in owning an iPhone. My wife has an iPhone, and I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. And I, hey, I have owned my Mac I've, ever since I started writing almost for uh, Audioholics. Mm-hmm. I think it was a couple of years. My second computer after, you know, I got one laptop, which was a PC, and then I got a Mac. And I've had Macs ever since. And they've progressively hated them more and more the longer, <laughs> the longer we've gone on. And I've gotten to the point now where I can't stand them. Ah. So, you know, I've given them a chance. I've been the, Ma- the Apple fanboy. I am not any longer. Well, FLAC support was kind of added back in iOS 11, um, but iTunes does not support FLAC, and it still doesn't. And the native music app on your iPhone didn't support FLAC in iOS 11, and it still doesn't in iOS 12. So as far as like putting FLAC files into your iTunes library and loading them onto your phone and playing them like all the rest of your music, nope. It's the same situation as it was in iOS 11. Now, does the iPhone have the ability to play back FLAC files? Yes, it does. Uh, And it's pretty much the same as it was in iOS 11. You can upload FLAC files to your iCloud account. Okay. At which point they'll be accessible in your Files app on your iPhone. And if you just click the file there, it'll play. I mean, it's a FLAC file. It's streaming down from your iCloud. Or you could sideload it using one of the third-party programs to load files onto your iPhone, at which point you can see them in your files app. Uh, If you just click on a FLAC file there, it'll play. So the iPhone is hardware capable of playing back a FLAC file. Uh, You could also use some third-party music playback software, and those will support FLAC, and the iPhone will play it. But if you were hoping that you could just use your iTunes library and the native music app uh, to play things, then nope. Same situation as it was in iOS 11. Mm. That's it. And that's why I hate I, that's why I hate Apple right there. That right there in a the nutshell is why I don't like it. Because I mean, you, you makes can, everything hard. You can quite easily convert FLAC files to ALAC files, the Apple lossless audio right. codec. Uh, you can convert that on your computer, and then ALAC, of course, will go nicely into iTunes and play in the native music app. So that, that'd be a way. But then I think the reason people have FLAC is because almost everything else plays FLAC natively yeah. and not necessarily ALAC, although a lot of things do play the yeah, they lossless do these, audio these codec. Days. As yeah. well, uh, see, so, I, yeah. I I initially uh, uploaded everything as a. I think it, it was a. I don't remember how I did it, but I had it either as FLAC or something something lossless, mm-hmm. and I had to convert them all to yeah. ALAC so I could get them into my Mac. Yeah, and now I'm like I have no like, now that I have no iPhone or anything, I have no way of getting to any of my music anymore. I'm like I. I mean, I guess Pandora is it. <laughs> I just <laughs> I put everything into 320 kilobit uh, AAC, and yeah, everything yeah. plays that. So, yeah, uh, and I'm not worried about. Yes, yes, 320, 320 kilobit AAC is lossy. What comes is. out is not exactly what went in. I have done multiple blind listening tests. I can't hear the difference. Yeah, uh, no, I don't I'm, think so. I'm fine with it. Bob. Bob's in-laws want to start using Netflix. Bob decided to get them a couple of Amazon Fire Sticks to add Netflix access to their two TVs, although the Fire Sticks are both still in their boxes in case he decides to return them. All right. (laughs) The TVs are quite old and only have a single HDMI input each, and those are taken up by a DVD player and cable box, respectively. So they watch cable in one room and DVDs in the other. That that seems to be the case. It's like they need to upgrade a TV. Bob supposes he could switch those two sources over to analog video connections so that the Fire Sticks could use the HDMI ports, but he's also thinking that he could maybe add HDMI switches instead. But he's leery of an HDMI switch solution. He doesn't want a second remote. This needs to be as dead simple as possible. He doesn't want tech support phone calls every time they want to switch over. Yep. So will an auto-switching HDMI switch work reliably? Or is there a rock-solid works-every-time solution for this? Uh, uh, with a stick and a cable box? An auto-switching? The, well, I mean, as long as... It, so the cable box is usually always on. Yeah. That's one of the problems. So what you end up having to do is having to put... So they're, they're, the switches are usually ordered. 
Yeah. So like number one is the highest priority. Number two is the second highest priority. Three, four, five, six, if, however many inputs you've got. So if you put the cable box at the end. Yeah. In the last slot. Yeah. And then you put the anything else in front of it, then when the thing in front of it turns on, mm -hmm. it should uh, take precedent over the cable box. But the problem is that the Amazon Fire TV stick, much like an NVIDIA Shield or most other streaming boxes, it also never really turns off. Oh, jeez. So oh. I don't know if auto switching would work. I wouldn't. I mean, you could give it a try. Uh, you but... could give it a try, yeah. But in the case of the, <laughs> the DVD player, it would definitely work. Yeah, the DVD player the... would be fine. You yeah. could put the DVD player. You just put the DVD player in front, basically, because yeah. the DVD play, when it turns off, it turns a hundred percent off. That's right. So for that one, it's fine. It's the cable box which is going to be your issue. Yeah, the cable box and the Fire TV. I'm not sure either of those is going to turn off enough that it, the switch will then go over to the the other device, whichever way, whichever way you order. Now, if you want to try one that has auto switching and it does come with a little IR remote. So, I mean, that'll always work, right? If you've got your cable box and your Fire TV stick and you're like, I want to switch over to the other one, then you, if if the auto switching doesn't work, you can use the little included IR remote. So I like the HDMI switches from Sewell. Um, they have their switch deck. They have a switch deck that is three HDMI ins with one HDMI out or one that is five HDMI ins with one HDMI out. I don't know, pick your poison, but the one that has three in is only 45 bucks. So it has auto switching, and it comes with a little IR remote. You could give that a try. Well, what about just first of all the other the other solution is going to work no matter what. We know that, right? the The DVD one will be yeah. Fine. The DVD one will be fine. Yeah. The other one though, why don't you get them a Harmony? And it doesn't have to be one of the high end harmonies. <laughs> he said you don't want it. tech support calls. Do you know of any calls he's gonna get if he gets them? No, no. You get the Harmony where you have the watch TV, uh, watch something else button. Yeah. And that should. He should be able to program that, and it should be no problem. And then there's a help button on there, too, where you press the help button, and it says, what's not working? Did this fix it? Did this fix it? Did this fix it? I know. People have such a hard time converting over to the activities version of things versus the I am controlling one device at a time mentality. I've met so well, many people. Well, if they don't who... want to have two remotes, then that's just the solution, right? Yeah. I mean, this is the solution. Yeah, it's, I mean, you don't have to get the real expensive harmony. You now, get the other one, and you could just write right on there, you know, just did, right on there, just like literally with whiteout, you know, TV, you know, K, you know TV, the you know, Netflix. A lot of them have Netflix buttons, anyways. I guess so. Now, the the one other thing I thought of, which is that again, over at Sewell, they actually have a little device. It's completely unpowered. It's the IBIS. They have a, a pro one and a non-pro one, but might as well get the pro one in case they ever up the gate to 4K or whatever, because it's only 25 bucks. Now, this little device has got two HDMIs on one side and one HDMI on the other side, but it's completely passive. You're literally just switching between, okay, that one out output, or it could be the input. It doesn't really matter. It's bi-directional. I mean, you're literally just switching from like which of the two is connected to the one on the other side. It's like you're physically moving a wire back and forth inside oh, and it's just a physical button on the top that you're like this side or the other side <laughs> this side or the other side it's i mean yes you'd have to physically get up and go over there and and click the button but there is one button it actually even lights up and like are you on hdmi 1 or hdmi 2 you can't get any more rock solid this will never fail on you than that if you only want to control it from the couch, then I guess that's a problem because you would have to physically go up there and press the button. But that is as rock run solid. Run HDMI cable, the two HDMI, run an HDMI cable all the way from the cable box <laughs> to the back of the room. Well, all the way from the TV, and then the, to well, this I mean, little I mean, box, which yeah, you could the put on the coffee the box, table. On the coffee table in the back of the room, yeah. And then the HDMI cable from the cable box which is probably at the front of the room anyways, to the back of the room to this little box, <laughs> and then plug the fire stick into the other one. And then you just toggle it right there. Yeah. I mean, to me, that is that is the most 100% reliable. Nobody could possibly be confused by this one. It's like, do you want this device or this device? And that's it. That's all you can possibly do. And there's no power cord to plug in or anything. It is just physically switching between which port is going to which one. So you could do that. 25 bucks. Might be easier just to buy a new TV. <laughs> you could, yeah. <laughs> then you have to switch inputs on the TV, which they're not used to doing. Yeah, well, whatever. Still, the Harmony remote is the real solution here. Right. 
Joe. Joe wrote this a while back uh, when he was getting his stuttering playback using Plex or J River on this HTPC. We, su we suggested a bunch of changes on both his LG OLED and his, in his computer, and after a bunch of fiddling, he did manage to get a stable picture. Unfortunately, switching between HDR and SDR content isn't a smooth process since the change in the signal isn't always properly detected, so he's mm. sort of given up for now. He's decided he'd like to try using an NVIDIA Shield instead, but one issue is that his receiver is a Yamaha RX A3050, which is old enough that it does not support 4K 60 signals, only 4K 30 at best, which is 4K 30 frames per second. Now, I want to talk on that for a little bit. First of all, I'm glad that the at least the stuttering frame rate thing, that yeah. the settings we suggested, which involved like putting your LG OLED into PC input mode. Right, right, uh, right That right. was the thing on that side, making sure that it had the full 18 gigabits ready to come in. And then on the other side, going into your video card settings or your Intel in integrated graphics settings and making sure that's outputting like the 23.976 thing that they label as 23 frames per second. So there's a bunch of stuff there. I'm glad that that did kind of work. But yes, I know well the problems of an HTPC connected via HDMI to a display and how you switch content between HDR, SDR, or frame rates or whatever, and it tries to do that new handshake and sometimes it just doesn't work. And you got to turn everything off and turn it all back on again. And then it usually does work, but that's a huge hassle, especially if you're trying to explain it to someone else in your house. Yeah, I can see why you would give up, because I did too, and I also switched over to an NVIDIA Shield. But I did want to mention on that Yamaha RX A3050, in its specs, it does say that it supports 4K at 60 hertz with 444 chroma subsampling, which is usually the thing you would look for to say that it supports the full 18 gigabits. Uh, so I'm not sure. I'm sure he was doing this with his computer because that's the right. source that he had that would output this. And I'm sure it didn't work when he's like set it to 4K 60. I'm wondering if it was set to 4K 60, a computer would be outputting RGB, which should right. be the same bandwidth as uh, 444. That, that's un uncompressed. It hasn't done any chroma subsampling if it's a 444 signal, which the Yamaha is supposed to be able to handle at 4K resolution at 60 frames per second. Uh, but maybe the computer was outputting 12-bit um, mm. color depth. Um, so you're saying that, his, that this is not going to be an issue? I'm saying it should work. The, yeah. the Yamaha should be able to pass this through. Uh, the, there were the HDMI ports that they technically support 4K at 60 at 444. Technically they do, but they actually had like 15.6 or 13.2 uh, gigabits per second instead of 18. It was like higher than the 10.2 gigabits per second, which would limit you to 30 frames per second at 4K resolution. But it wasn't quite the full 18. Uh, like actually last year's Sony projectors had that. Their 4K projectors had that weird in-between one that was like mm. 13.2 or 15.6 or something instead of the full 18. So maybe that's what's going on with the Yamaha. Because I'm like, he tried it, it didn't work, so something went wrong. Right. But they do claim that it can do 4K 60 at 444. So the NVIDIA Shield will definitely not be outputting RGB unless you specifically tell it to, which it won't do by default. Uh, and it should it should be fine because it actually defaults. I mean, it's kind of answering a second question, but it actually defaults if you connected it to your LG OLED to sending 4K resolution, 60 frames per second at 422 or 420. So it is doing right. some chroma subsampling, which reduces the bandwidth. The band, yeah, that should. I mean, so honestly, the that, NVIDIA no should, should be with, fine with going to the uh, chroma subsampling. Is is I mean, I don't see any real benefit to going 444 other than. It well, on a PC, it, on a PC, it kind of makes sense. If you're looking at a website that right. has a colored background with colored text, yeah, uh, then four, those, you want the 444. Those people should. should. <laughs> if it's black and white text, you don't even need it. But if it's a yeah, colored background yeah. and colored text, you want yeah. that on a, on a PC. But NVIDIA Shield should be, it should go through your Yamaha fine. All right, so he asked, should he run the NVIDIA Shield through the Yamaha anyway? And the answer is, well, you should at least try. Yeah, definitely give it a, before <laughs> buying before anything. Before buying anything give else. Because it, it should work. So, so he asks, should he get an HDMI splitter or is there some other solution he should buy? Uh, I mean, the HDMI splitter, I don't think fixes this problem. It won't help you because, yeah, it's going it, to see... Gonna, it's going to see the lowest common denominator yeah. there and then that's what it's going to... It will only 
output that. So That's the HDMI right. splitter will not help you. You'd have to buy a more expensive device like one of those HD thingies. Yeah, it's be the HD Fury, the AVR key, which is specifically for this. The AVR key, what it does is you have the one output from your source device. It passes through the full fat video, whatever that might be, just the video to your display device. And then it has a second HDMI output that is audio only. And right. that gets fed to your AV receiver, of course. So the AVR key would 100% work, but, but it's like $150, yeah. Yeah, 150 yeah, yeah, bucks. Yeah. It's very, a lot cheaper just to try the NVIDIA Shield. Oh, definitely dude, definitely <laughs> plug the Shield into your Yamaha and your Yamaha yeah. into your LG OLED because it really should work. Yeah. So what settings should he use on the NVIDIA Shield? What does Rob use when connecting his NVIDIA Shield to his LG OLED? Any limitations? Oh, there's limitations. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Up. So... Um, as far as the, uh, so it's got within the settings, so you go up, there's a little gear icon in the upper right hand corner, that's your settings, you go in there, and it has one that's for uh, audio and video settings. So within there, it's got the HDMI video output, and it actually has like an auto detect, uh, it has a, a recommended setting, and mm. give that a try, because it really should work, and that'll actually tell you right away if your Yamaha is limiting anything, because like I say, right. in my case, it goes, okay, your LG can do 4K resolution, it can do 60 frames per second, it can do Rec 2020 color, and it can do, uh, like, so it's sending it as, in my case, it defaulted to 420, and there doesn't seem to be a 422 override, but 420 is fine, because that's what all the sources are anyway. Right. Uh, so that's what it defaulted to on the recommended. I would probably just go with that. Uh, on the audio side, you do have the option to set it to a fixed volume output. And since you're using a AV receiver, I would definitely toggle that on because you don't want yep. the NVIDIA Shield itself altering its volume level coming in and out, which it does all the time on their stupid little remote where it's a uh, capacitive touch sensitive volume slider <laughs> that you can't help but hit with the palm of your hand sometimes. So uh. definitely turn on the fixed volume setting. And then you want to make sure that the surround sound output is set to auto because otherwise... Yeah, the other two settings are everything is in stereo, which makes sense, or it's fixed to surround sound all the time, which means it's decoding everything inside and then re-encoding it into a surround sound format. And you don't want to do that, so leave that at audio. So the audio side is pretty easy. On the HDMI side, you have a whole bunch of options, and here is where the limitation comes in. When you set whatever your HDMI output is on the NVIDIA Shield, at the moment, everything comes out in that. <laughs> all right? Mm. So... Everything will be in a Rec 2020 container, uh, as far as the uh. color goes. Everything will be upscaled to 4K resolution. All right. Now, it does have the ability to switch frame rates on the fly. So if you go into your Netflix app or you go into your Plex app or whatever, and that is now outputting 24 frames a second, it will switch the frame rate. So that automatically switches. But the color space will always be locked to, in my case, Rec 2020 container. For some TVs, that's a big problem because some TVs, if they see that the signal coming in is Rec 2020, they lock themselves to their wide color gamut, no matter what. And that'll screw up the colors if the original source was Rec 709 colors and not Rec 2020 colors. In the case of the LG OLEDs, if you leave them set to auto, it seems to work okay. It, it says, okay, it's a Rec 2020 container, but the actual colors inside are Rec. 709, and it seems to display them properly. I, I haven't noticed an issue. So you have an LG okay. OLED, I have an LG OLED. Leaving it at Rec. 2020 color doesn't seem to be a problem. I don't have a problem with the NVIDIA Shield upscaling everything to 4K resolution. Because Has happened eventually. <laughs> your TV is going to do that anyway. Yeah. And it does switch the frame rate. So I'm okay with it, but if you have one of the TVs where it, you know, Rec. 2020 comes in and it locks itself to the wide color gamut, and now it screws up all your colors... That, that is a problem, and you have to manually switch the NVIDIA Shield. <laughs> now, they say they're working on that. They say they're working on automatic color space switching, uh, but it hasn't arrived yet. So that, that seems to be the case for now. All right. Yeah, solves all your problems there. <laughs> Total Babble Podcast on Twitter. We have another podcast asking our podcast questions. You were the one who forwarded this to me. I, the... I did? Yes, this was the one you forwarded. And I only have Total Babble, Babble podcast because I don't know I don't know if, who who from that podcast was writing to us, oh, yeah. so I didn't assume. Anyways, they have a pair of Polk uh, RTI A1 speakers and a 10-inch Polk sub that isn't connected or being used right now, and they have a Yamaha receiver. With the Emotiva TA100 Basox, mm -hmm. integrated stereo amp be a worthwhile upgrade. 
Well, I don't know what AV receiver you have from Yamaha. Do mm. you have a flagship? <laughs> Do you Doesn't have sound an like entry it. level? Doesn't sound like it. Uh, would it be a worthwhile upgrade? Uh, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't. I mean, I mean how it... far how far away are you sitting? <laughs> and I guess this is another thing. Yeah. But these Polk should be easy to drive, no matter yeah. what it is. And any AV receiver, especially if you only have it in two channel mode, should have no problems driving it. That I don't think that you would notice a sound difference yeah that was that was easy for you to identify with a blindfold on <laughs> without yeah. you knowing which one was playing it <laughs> i think they would sound exactly the same to you uh yeah yeah the, i mean yeah. the emotiva ta100 which is uh as far as i'm concerned a nice integrated stereo amp uh what is it, it is 400 dollars, nice, yeah. i believe it is so yeah it's not, yep it's yep. not insanely overpriced or anything nope. like that uh i think it's 50 or 60 watts per channel or something like that so something but it doesn't matter it doesn't really <laughs> matter um, speakers anyways so i mean it has a couple of things it has a really nice phono input that supports both moving magnet and moving coil uh, okay. you, you wouldn't have that. I think he's, he said his Yamaha receiver is rated at 80 watts per channel. Um, so that's definitely uh, not a flagship. Entry. Yeah, I was going to say that's entry level. And I, I it. doubt it has a phono input. And if it does have a phono input, it would only support moving magnet for sure. Right. So if you have you know, a, a record player, and particularly if it's a moving coil record player, you could make an argument that, yeah, that Emotiva has a really nice phono input. That could be a reason to get it. Uh, it also has a really nice headphone amplifier. Um, okay. So Which if you use seems to defeat the purpose of having a two channel a little bit, system. but if you use headphones a lot and you want one device that can do both, it does yeah. have a really nice headphone amplifier built in. Okay. Um, so yeah, those those are a couple of things: phono or headphone. Those are legitimate reasons that you might go for it. Uh, it does have a summed together line level output that you could connect to a subwoofer, but it is not bass management. Oh, well, that's All nice. right. So it's not applying a high-pass so filter to yeah. your speaker. So it's not filtering the bass out of your speakers and sending it to the sub. It's just also sending a, a signal to a subwoofer. It does have the ability to do that, which is great because a lot of integrated stereo amps don't have any way to connect a subwoofer right. other than speaker wire. But it's not bass management. So I would prefer to have proper bass management so in any sort of room, you know, because does Ema TV even have an auto setup on this thing? I would guess not. No, there's no right? there's no EQ on the TA100. There's no auto yeah. setup. I mean, at least you got YPOW on the Yamaha. Yeah. Um, Some so, version of it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Basically, if you don't have a record player or headphones that need a really good headphone amp, I wouldn't because there's no real reason other, you know, like no, the Yamaha actually have... gives you more in a way. Yeah. It gives you the if base you management. Have... Yeah. Anything, and you said I want to buy this this thing from Emotiva. I'd be like, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, you can. You, I would probably still push you towards a receiver mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of all the other things that you're going to get. Yeah, including base management and room and correction. auto setup. Yeah, uh, and auto setup. Uh, but yeah, it, it, would this be an upgrade? Unlikely. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't go buying this hoping to get some kind of big audible upgrade unless, like I say, you got a moving coil record player. <laughs> Bob in the Philippines. I remember Bob. He was the one using the VPN. Bob just started using Plex, and for the most part, he loves it. It has all of his content stored. Uh, I'm sorry, he has all of his content stored in a RAID array that is connected via Thunderbolt to his iMac. He set up the Plex server on his iMac, and if he opens the Plex player on his iMac, everything works very well, and he sees all of the metadata on each movie nicely laid out. Mm -hmm. He connected an NVIDIA Shield to his OLED TV and ran Plex on that. It found his IMAX Plex server via his network, and he's able to play his content, but a lot of the metadata doesn't seem to show up. Just the thumbnail poster and a short description, but not all of the detail about the video and audio and the cast members, extra features pulled from the web, and so on. Mm -hmm. So his setup is mostly functional, but he'd like to have all those nice detailed details and metadata to show up when he's using his shield on his OLED. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to make that happen? Should he be using a different setup configuration for Plex? I don't have a clue, dude. Uh, but I, I want to blame the Mac. <laughs> 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 well, you can't really blame the Mac because I have the same <laughs> thing on my Windows PCs. Okay, all right, all right. All right. Yeah, I'm Still not. Bit. I'm not exactly sure why this happens. Um, so, I mean, I basically all along I've I've set up a Plex server on whatever device I was using at the time, and I never took them offline. They're all still there. If I want to, I can still log into them. They're all attached to my one Plex account, so I can log into any of my Plex servers if they happen to be 
you know, turned on with and they're powered up. Uh, I can log into them at any time. And this this does seem to happen. I don't know why it is. Um, if I'm using uh, one that's set on, on a Windows PC, if I'm watching it on that PC, all the metadata is there. But if it's on a remote device, some other device that's connected to my network, uh, all of the metadata does not show up. Mm, exactly like you described. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure why. So the end. I wonder if it's Shield, because the device itself is the one that's calling for the metadata that's not coming from the Plex server. Maybe, yeah. Because if that's if that's if that's the case, then uh, you know your computer has got probably faster internet access and uh, maybe is using a specific database that your phone. But I mean, like or the, the, the things aren't even there. Like the headers aren't even there. It's not like it's, it's, very it's not just it's not populating. It's just that it's not there. It's, not part of it. So yeah, cool. um, the NVIDIA Shield itself can be a Plex server. And at least in my setup, so if so, if I'm using the Plex server that's on my NVIDIA Shield, yeah. and then I go and access that from one of my Windows PCs or from my phone for that matter, the Plex app on my phone, for whatever reason, all of the metadata does show up <laughs> going that <laughs> direction. Okay, so maybe maybe it's the NVIDIA Shield is the best one. Well, Whatever. like I say, it's a fantastic Plex server. Um, yeah. It's really fast. It does the transcoding on the fly. Like if you are like you're out of your house, you're accessing it on your phone or your tablet via the internet, logging into your own Plex server back at home. That they call that the remote access. I mean, the transcoding that the NVIDIA Shield does on the fly is like a one. That's that's probably the best version of it. So you might consider that you want to make your Plex server on your NVIDIA Shield now instead. That would allow you to have, the, obviously, the metadata on the Plex itself. And it does seem, I mean, I don't know on an iMac. I don't have one, so I can't test it. I don't know if it'll work. Maybe it won't go in the other direction. But on a Windows PC, it does. Um, now, there is, of course, a huge headache. Because when you first plug in your NVIDIA Shield and you first open the Plex app and it says, log into your Plex account, so you go ahead and do that, and then it gives you a little code and you punch that in, on, on a web server and that connects you to your Plex account and that all seems good. It will then say, do you want to set up a Plex server on this NVIDIA Shield? Now, of course, Bob would have skipped past that because he's like, right. I already got one. I got one. So now the question is, well, how do I get back to that setup process? Because yeah, if you- I, I, I have a feeling the answer is going to be a uh, factory reset. Not <laughs> quite, <laughs> but man oh man, is, is it a pain? Because okay. so if you go into the, so you go into your NVIDIA Shield, you go into its Plex app, and you go into that, the settings in there, there's a whole section in there for Plex Media Server. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I uh, should be able to set it up in there, right? Unfortunately, no, there doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work. <laughs> Not only do you have to erase the Plex app off of your NVIDIA Shield, you have to go into the NVIDIA Shield settings, go into its app section, go de scroll down the huge list of apps because there's a gazillion things running in the background, find the Plex Media Server and erase all of its data from like the cache, from any- It will any... remember all that stuff. Huh? It'll remember yeah. all that because if you reinstall the Plex app, it'll be like, we already went through the setup. I got the data right here. So you got to manually erase every trace of Plex from the NVIDIA Shield, then reinstall it. And then it'll go, oh, it's the first time you want to set up a Plex server. So, I mean, That's, there is a way. It'll work, but it, oh, it's a pain. Such a pain. Because finding all of that cache data. Sounds like factory reset is the way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think I, I think I even tried that, and it still remembered. Oh, my gosh. Because it, like, reset itself, but it's like, but the cache is still here. So, yeah. yeah, manually erase everything. Then you can go through it, and you can set up a Plex server on your NVIDIA Shield. Now, there's still another headache that I have to oh, warn you geez. about because... If you're on your computer and you set up a Plex server on your computer, you're like, okay, I populate my Plex server. Here's where all my storage is. And it brings all in all your stuff and it brings in all the metadata automatically. And it seems all quite nice. On the NVIDIA Shield, there's no way to manually manage what is in your NVIDIA Shield's Plex server on the NVIDIA Shield itself. You must log into your Plex account in a web browser, then access your NVIDIA Shield server through that web browser, and then you can populate everything there. So you have to have a second device, which is a bit crazy. All right. But you have to do it through a web browser to set up your Plex server as far as all the stuff. There's one other thing, which is you said you have this, this storage, which doesn't sound like it's network attached storage. It's connected no, by it's a Thunderbolt physically attached, yeah. to his iMac. So that could be a little bit of an issue because 
it's not too hard to connect a network attached storage. You can actually say, um, well, what's the word that they use for it? Shoot. Uh, where you, you, you like load network attached storage onto a, vi- a device. Shoot, what is that called? I'm forgetting the name for There's a specific name for that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's in the, the NVIDIA Shield storage settings and you can say, okay, I want to like uh, attach network storage to my NVIDIA Shield. That'll work okay. So you might have to... Ugh, you got a storage connected via Thunderbolt to his iMac. That means you'd have to leave your iMac on all the time, set up your iMac as a network drive. Yeah, I've done that before. That does not work very well, Max. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. It's going to be I, a headache, get, Bob. You, yeah, it might be easier just to connect that directly to like your router. Yeah. And have it accessible through that. Yeah, because I'm sure your router has an USB input, and I'm sure yeah. you can connect that storage via USB. It won't be as fast as Thunderbolt, but it should still be okay. USB 3 is still pretty quick. Or, I mean, just connect it to the back of the and the shield too isn't that possible or you could Can't live you? without the metadata and keep what you have like I'm, <laughs> this, this isn't going to be super simple easy bob I mean, it can be done all of this stuff can be done it could be a headache setting it up everybody who listens to this podcast and you, you've heard me say over and over again why i don't I'm deal not with home theater pc <laughs> in, in, in htpcs you now Understand. If you didn't understand before, you understand now. I've reviewed a couple of devices that are HTPCs. I've reviewed HTPCs, and they've all been like this. Yeah. And this is way better than it used to be. Oh, yeah. This is way better than it used to be. But it's still like, oh, I just want to change one little thing. <laughs> I'll see you in a week, sir. You know, <laughs> you know, have, fun, have fun on Reddit, because that's where you're going to define your answer. Again, if, you it, if his RAID array has a USB output, you could plug it straight into the NVIDIA Shield. That's what I'm, That's probably the easiest solution to this. Yeah, uh, and then, I mean, I'm assuming he has stuff on that RAID array other than just media that he might want to access from his computer. So then you would have to set up the NVIDIA Shield as a network thing that your iMac could access. I mean, you could go the other direction. Yeah. Right? That, that'd that be another way. But yeah, either way, a little bit of fussing, fussing with this will be, have to be done. Whew. Brandon. Brandon at first just wanted to mention that everything seems to be working quite nicely as far as Atmos on the Apple TV 4K goes. However, Amazon Prime Video, <laughs> shocking no one, on the Apple TV still isn't the greatest. <laughs> Also shocking no one. <laughs> Boy, they can put the they can put that girl in every device that you own, but they cannot get lip sync right on their dive on their streaming service. Not only does not support Atmos yet with their one show, Jack Ryan, that's available with an Atmos soundtrack. By the way, I got two episodes in that show and gave up. Okay. I just don't like it. It's he's goofy looking and I, I <laughs> and uh, he's you gotta shoot him from the side. You cannot shoot him straight on. He looks like uh, the Wallace and Gromit guy, you know, with the big cheek, <laughs> the big round cheeks. I can't stand it. Just just don't shoot him straight on. Like, they're shooting him, like, rowing, and they're shooting him doing sit-ups and stuff. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> Go from the side. This guy looks way better from the side. And he's all buff out, too, man. I mean, he's really, yeah. he's really done work to get this part. But I just, I, I, I there was somebody on Facebook the other day saying how much they love this show. I'm like, two episodes, that's all I could, like, that's all I could handle. Yeah. I'll try again. But the lip sync was also bothering me, too. But I'll try again. <laughs> Uh, but almost always, uh, almost everything still plays in stereo. So <laughs> Atmos is not working so well. Not only is Atmos not working, but you know, surround sound, something that, that we've had to be for Amazon about Prime's thing, man. 10 years. So anyways, he's still using his Xbox one X for that service. And that seems to be only, uh, the only streaming box other than the Apple fire TV, 4k, Amazon or the fire, TV. T- I'm sorry, apps, Amazon fire TV, 4k, or the fire TV cube that were re- reliably plays Amazon Prime Video in 5.1. Mm-hmm. But he switched over to the Apple TV 4K for everything else. Great. So yet again, reinforce it. There's there's not one box that does everything super well. I mean, the Apple TV 4K does still doesn't play YouTube videos in, in 4K because Apple and Google no, no like each other. <laughs> so stupid. So if you want YouTube, if you want Amazon, Apple TV 4K is probably not the way to go. Everything else... Uh, we're still hoping that Plex gets updated to support Atmos as well, but we don't know if that's going to happen. Or not. So it's like you want Plex, you get an Nvidia Shield. You want right. iTunes and Netflix. Then you get Apple TV 4K. You want Amazon Prime. You probably get a Fire or an Xbox. Oh, it's all over the place. So, anyways, Rob mentioned having a custom Ascend Horizon Center speaker with a very thin front to back depth. What are the exact dimensions, mm-hmm. and how much more did it cost than the standard Horizon Row? So. Okay. 
if you want the exact, oh, these are exact, because Dave even gave me the CAD drawings. It is exactly 40 inches wide. It is, ex you want exact 11.03 <laughs> inches high. So if you have exactly 11 inches, it needs a teeny bit of wiggle room in there. <laughs> It's 0 0.03 inches more than 11 inches, and it is exactly seven and a half inches deep, although it does have binding posts on the back. Oh, right. So they yeah, yeah. go to a little bit more, a little bit more than that. But They're the cabinet great. itself is exactly seven and a half inches deep. Uh, so the regular one, so the regular Horizon uh, as it is with the normal dome tweeter is $1,000. It is $350 to add the RAL ribbon tweeter. So $1,350 is the normal price for a Sierra Horizon RAL center from Ascend. I got mine that was custom made and was essentially a one-off. Like he designed the cabinet for me. He had no existing plans for a center with these dimensions. He made that for me. And all by itself, he was going to charge me $2,000 for that. So it's significant, but it was a lot of work. Like this right, was right, not a sure. trivial thing that he did. But I bought eleven Ascend speakers all at the same time. So he priced it at seventeen fifty, which is the same price that he normally prices any of the custom cabinets for a design that he's already made. So there are like Horizon speakers that um, have been reoriented so that the tweeter is beside the mid-range driver, so that it isn't eleven inches high. It's now only like seven and a half or eight inches high, uh, or you can turn that vertically, right? So now you have a tweeter above the mid-range driver or vice versa. So he already made those plans before and normally he'll charge $17.50 for that. So it's $400 more than the standard one. There you go. Infinite Gary. As we know, Gary had his OLED TV professionally calibrated, but for sports in particular, he tweaked some of the settings and preferred how things looked that way. He tried leaving the TV with those tweak settings for everything else, but for pretty much Everything other than sports, things looks more balanced and accurate using the professional, uh, professionally calibrated settings. So, what's our opinion on using different picture, a different picture mode with tweaks settings for specific content, uh, like sports? I'm a hundred percent okay with that. Yeah, the sure. the other picture modes are there. You're doing no damage. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. Go ahead. I mean, I what? I I purposely have a day and a night mode. Yeah. Because sometimes, like, my, my apartment is not 100% light controlled during the day, and I do sometimes watch TV during the day. It is definitely brighter than at night. And I want to still see all the shadow detail, so I have slightly different settings for day and night mode, which a professional calibrator will, most of them do that. They'll right. set up both a day and a night mode. Uh, but, I mean, right there is a thing saying, hey, some situation about what I'm watching changed. In my case, ambient light levels changed. So I'm using a different picture mode, but it's as simple as toggling between two different picture modes. If you want a third picture, I mean, I have a third picture mode for playing video games because I want no latency. I want as little lag as I can get during video games. That's a you third still play picture video mode. Games? I, I not very often. But. I was going to say, I, I love playing video games, but man, I just can't find the time. Neither can I. But when I do for occasions here and there, like I want to play some Cuphead and Cuphead is a twitchy game. So I want oh, the low yeah. latency. Yeah, 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 yeah. Throw the TV there into game mode, right? So third mode. So, hey, if you want a sports mode, knock yourself out. TV's got it. Yeah, I got no problem with that. Cuphead looked like a fun game. It is fun. It's hard. It's super hard. God, it's hard. <laughs> I mean, I've been playing uh, Slay the Spire, which is a card based, a card deck building game, which is very, it's perfect for me. I could play five minutes of it and press save and then come mm -hmm. back to it. You know, you don't have to do anything. So I, I just, my kids are playing Overwatch and all that other crap. I ah, yes. Bothered. Matt. Matt has an SVS SB12 NSD. It's it is the only subwoofer he owns, and he really he says he really isn't in the position to upgrade it or add a second one at the moment. His room is open concept, so he's dealing with roughly fourteen hundred square, not cubic feet. So, a million. Uh, <laughs> obviously, a seat uh, a sealed twelve inch sub isn't really adequate, and he's but he's making do for now. He wants to know. Is he running a risk of damaging the SB12 NSD? Is the amplifier well protected, or could he potentially turn it up too loud to the point it could damage itself? This is SVS. They do not damage themselves. This is a sledge amplifier. That's SVS's own design. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, it's a sealed sub. Sealed right. subs inherently are a little better protected in that, uh, like, the They're driver 
it has a real tough time bottoming out because yeah. as it pushes farther and farther out, the, the pressure inside of the cabinet stays constant. So it's trying to suck it back in. The air itself is right, like, right. It's to... creating a vacuum, basically. A yeah. bit of a vacuum. Yeah. So, uh, but so you combine it being sealed with it being a sledge amp, which is really, really well protected. Yeah. Uh, crank that thing up pretty much as high as you want. I mean, if you're hearing bad noises. <laughs> True. Yeah, well turn, then, yeah. Turn her down a little. Turn down a little bit, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, you're you're pretty darn safe. Uh, you're about as safe as I could say you could be with any subwoofer. The, yeah, yeah, you're good. His TV is a 55 inch LG LH90 that he's owned for eight years now. It's I have one, one of, the... of those. Of course you do. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, one I of these days, I'm gonna I'm going to go to Rob's apartment, and it's just going to be like the clearance. The Dude, it is a mess right now in my place of, of, of been Best Buy. It's waiting just... for some time to clear up. It is a mess. So it's one of the full, uh, the first full array local dimming LCD TVs, and it still looks fantastic. He'd like a larger screen size, and of course, 4K and HDR would be cool. But again, he's not in a position to upgrade at the moment, so he'd like to know, do the LEDs in the backlight dim over time? He's kept the same backlight setting for eight years now, but should he be bumping that up a little to compensate for LEDs gradually dimming over the years? Now, Rob and I spoke about this briefly before the podcast. I mean, I don't think LEDs dim all that much. I mean, that's sort of their deal is that they're just super bright. I mean, certainly not then, like a lamp. Yeah, <laughs> like a lamp's going to lo- lose like 50, you know, over the over its lifetime, whatever its lifetime is like, you know, 50% of its brightness. I don't think that happens with LEDs. I think they just die. <laughs> <You're> gonna, <laughs> you know, they're I mean, either on or they're off. They're kind of binary in that way. But... I mean, you could. You could bump it up and see, but yeah. it doesn't sound like you're experiencing like, oh, it just looks dimmer than it used to. I don't right. know. You know I, I, I watched this movie that I've watched many times on my TV, and it looks different to me now. Should I adjust the backlight? And that, and that then I would say yes. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I mean, you can adjust it. There's nothing... I mean, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not gonna say, Don't <laughs> oh, do for it. sure. Yeah. I mean, go, go ahead. If you like the look better with the backlight setting clicked up a few ticks, yeah. go for it. Um, yeah. I mean, technically, they they do kind of, they do still rate it as a half, a half life, you know, like a, a half brightness thing, which in the case of these LEDs is 20,000 hours. <laughs> um so the eight years if they are I think he's probably has it could be yeah so i mean if they are <laughs> dimming over time it, it is very gradual certainly far more gradual than a lamp and a projector but um yeah i mean yeah basically answers to say if, if if you want to give it a try there's no harm in doing it uh i get you could measure i suppose right how many right. how many nits am i getting now <laughs> well on a full white field or on an anti checkerboard how many nits are coming up but you would have had to measure at the beginning to, to make that comparison to know. yeah at which, this point yeah. which we know you didn't do so uh yeah it, it's not a concern give it a give it a click up if you like it better leave it there all right so we've talked a bit about gamma but could we explain it in a little more detail? His TV just gives him setting options of low, medium, high. Mm-hmm. He followed David Katz- Katzmeyer's settings for the LH90 from CNET, which have looked great all this time. David said to set the gamma to low. Matt tried the medium setting. Notice that the image looked a bit higher in contrast overall, but it lost a bit of shadow detail. So what do we recommend? I'm sure we recommend low. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like. <laughs> but uh, yeah, do you want to talk more about gamma and knock yourself out? Rob? Yeah. So uh, so more. gamma, the, the way to understand this, so there's a signal that's being sent to your television. And uh, we'll just go by the standard, which is the, the IRE scale, which goes from zero to 100. And the idea is that each step along the IRE scale is supposed to be like the least perceptible difference, right? So from zero to one is like, I can just see that one is a teeny tiny bit brighter than zero. And two is a teeny tiny bit brighter than one. And since we have in 8-bit video, theoretically 256 steps, but we cut off from zero to 16 and we cut off from 235 to uh, 55. Um, We basically have around 200 steps to work with. So they put in a step in between each of those so that it's a very smooth, you don't see, you don't see any stepping between zero and one and one and two. There's a step in between, which is imperceptible. So if you go from zero to a half and from a half to one, that looks like a completely smooth transition. And it's a very, very small difference anyway. But our eye doesn't perceive uh, greater and greater amounts of light linearly. At the very, very low end, from zero light to a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of light, it's a minuscule difference where our eye says, oh, there's some light now. 
Uh, whereas at very bright ranges, we need a whole bunch more light to be able to tell that it's brighter versus the step before it. So there's a there's a curve to our eye. Now in the old CRT days, it it ha it's a like it was literally a coincidence that the phosphors in a CRT responded to this incoming signal in a way that was very close to the way our eye tracks. So you go from zero to one and the CRT got a teeny tiny bit brighter, but just enough for eye to notice. Whereas up at the higher end going from 99 to 100, uh, the CRT got significantly brighter enough that is just enough for our eye to notice. So there were these curves that we ended up with. Mm -hmm. And so the signal is this linear thing. That would be a gamma of one. No changes made. It's just this linear straight line. But then we have these other curves. And as you increase the numerical value of the gamma, you can think of it. So think of like a diagonal line, because not everybody's looking at the YouTube video. Uh, think of a diagonal line going up, uh, starting at the bottom on the left and up at the top on the right. Now imagine that you grabbed that line with your right hand and pulled it down towards the lower right hand corner that would be like increasing the numerical value of gamma it's like pulling a bow string right. so that the higher the numerical value the more you're bending that graph down towards the lower right hand corner which means that if you have a higher numerical value of gamma the difference from zero to one and one to two and two to three is even slighter than if you had a lower numerical value of gamma, then the jump from one to two would be a little bit more. And you notice it most in the lowest ranges. Once you get up to the top, like once you get up to 100, they're all the same. They're all, they all end up being the same brightness way up at the top. So that's kind of what gamma is about. It's, it's the rate of rise from dark to light in response to the signal. The signal said, get a bit brighter. Well, exactly how much brighter depends on your gamma setting. High numerical value, it got a teeny bit brighter. Low numerical value, it got a little bit brighter than that in response to the signal. So that's kind of what's going on with gamma. Um, does that basically answer that until the second question? Yeah, oh, well, well so. what do we recommend? Um, uh, oh. David Katzmeyer, uh, he goes by the gamma of 2.2. That's what he used to go by back when the LH90 came out. And that is what pretty much all television content is mastered to. Hmm. Is a gamma of 2.2. Now, movies that were meant specifically for a completely blacked out movie theater usually used a gamma of 2.4, right? So 2.4, slightly higher numerical value of gamma, which means that in the very dark ranges, it's not getting, it, you know, it's even more gradual, which makes hmm. sense in a completely blacked out room. Right, sure. Your, your pupil is wide open. The amount of light you need to notice a difference is even a bit smaller. So movies, 2.4. Most television, 2.2. He's like, is a TV. You're probably watching TV. You probably aren't in a 100% blacked out room. I'll target 2.2 because that's what most things are mastered for. That's what ratings still goes for. Some calibrators, some reviewers are like, I, I want movies in a completely blacked out room. I target 2.4. So the low setting on the LH90 is basically 2.2. That's why he recommends it. The medium setting is pretty close to 2.4. And then the high setting is like a 2.6 or 2.8. It looks it looks too dark. Yeah. So if you're in a completely black room, then using the medium setting, it probably would make sense. I'm betting you're not in a 100% black room. The low setting is probably correct. So we tried reading up a bit on uh, gamma. Chris Heinewins... Did I say that right? Heinen. 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 Yeah. Heinen. Heinen. Lots of no. ends in there. Yeah. There's lots of them. Uh, which gamma is correct article in particular? It was rather confusing. There are quite a few mentions of BT1886. <laughs> that's uh, that's when Paul Revere did his ride, I think. Uh, <laughs> what is that and how would he go about using it on this LH90? I mean, you don't need to use it. You just set it to low. <laughs> uh, not only that, you can't on your LH90. Yeah. <laughs> so that answers that part. You don't have to worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> but BT1886, it's uh, relatively new. I think 2011 is when that came out. Um, and the whole idea was, so when they were doing HDR, uh, they, they changed away from gamma. They're like, we're not gonna, just going to use this curve, which is like a, a floating curve, right? Uh, depending on where you start, like where is black on this curve? Right. Where is peak white? Well, that, that, that could change. You, you could float that along the curve, but you would follow along the curve. Well, with HDR, they went away from that. They're like, no, now we have absolute values. This signal level means exactly this many nits. We're not following a curve. It's a table 
of one to one. And so they changed the name from gamma to an electro optical transfer function, right? So electrical to optical and a transfer function, a, a lookup table. That's what it is. Here's what the signal says, how many nits ought to come out. It's exactly one to one. Uh, so BT1886, it's not exactly that for SDR because the black level and the peak white level could still be different. So in BT1886, you measure what is the blackest that this television can produce and what is the peak white level that we have chosen. And then it gives you a formula for mm. everywhere between those two points. Here's exactly how many nits should come out based on the signal level, that 0 to 100 IRE signal level that we talked about before. Now, in essence, it ends up looking a heck of a lot like 2.4 gamma. <laughs> It's, it's really not very different from 2.4 gamma, but it's a little bit more similar to the way HDR is handled in that after you measure black and peak white and apply the formula, it now has specific, this signal means exactly this many nits values. It's not just following a floating curve. Uh, so that's BT1886, and you can't do it on your LH90, so you don't have to worry. All right, Curtis. Curtis asked us previously how we determine whether or not a subwoofer can genuinely play down to 20 hertz. We basically seem to say that we believe the specs given by some manufacturers, but don't believe the specs have been given by other manufacturers. And we rely on, on our experience to determine which ones we believe and which ones we don't. But what exactly are the specs that help us decide? Mm. What numbers are we looking at? Which spec in a long list of numbers tells us whether or not a subwoofer can genuinely play down to 20 hertz? We've said minus 3 dB or the negative 3 dB point a bunch of times. What does, exactly does that mean? Okay, so... I did not get this far down these questions when I was trying to prep the five. This is a, this is a good question. Podcast. I'm happy this, to answer. This, this is a good yeah. question. Yeah. So uh, when you go to a website, you know, or a spec sheet, and you will see that they will have uh, most speaker manufacturers of will tell you, you know, this is the frequency response. Yeah. The frequency range of which we play. Yeah, you usually see the spec frequency response. Sometimes it'll just say like frequency range or even just yeah. frequency. Uh, and so, sometimes they'll have one that says frequency extension. Yeah. Well, it'll be it, something if the word frequency will probably be, will be you'd look for the word frequency <laughs> yeah. and and they'll there'll be a range in there and sometimes like for a normal speaker like just today i was looking at one that said that it played from you know uh, 40 hertz up to tw you know 22 kilohertz sure right that's what it said but then it had a separate spec which said that it it's uh usable or what it didn't really say it's negative 3 db is from 60 hertz up to you know 20 kilohertz okay so basically what it was saying is you know the, the, this speaker will make sound that is audible you know from at some you know measurable from you know tw you know 40 hertz up to 22. okay that's that can be measured but it can play flat you know basically flat ish uh with a 3 db variance from 40 hertz up to 20. Yeah. So like, and that's what we're looking for in these uh, in these subwoofers. We're looking for that specification. Yeah. We're looking for the specification that says it'll it'll has a negative three dB from this to this, and the 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 lower one is what we're looking at to see whether or not it should play down to twenty hertz. Uh, if a subwoofer manufacturer does not say negative three dB, they just say we'll play from eighteen hertz up to one hundred and twenty hertz. Then you're like, okay. That's that's just how much output <laughs> this yeah. thing, this thing could actually make noise that could be measured from there to from there to there. Where's the negative three dB point? Well, if you've ever seen an actual subwoofer be measured, you'll see that it'll go along pretty nicely, and then usually it drops off precariously, yeah. you know, towards the end there, because where it's not really making a, a sound they can hear. So you have to back that number up, and usually you're backing it up quite a bit. And depending on the speaker manufacturer and what they've said about it, it could be. Like I said, the other speaker was playing from 40 to whatever. And then when you look at the negative 3 dB, it was 60. That's 20, right. I mean, 20 hertz difference is quite a bit. Now, subwoofers may not be quite that dramatic, but they can be, uh, you know, a good 5, 10 dB oh, I mean, yeah. a frequency difference, you know, hertz difference there. Yeah, so imagine you took a, a speaker or a subwoofer and you took it outside or you put it in an anechoic chamber, somewhere where the room isn't going to have an effect on the sound anymore. That's right. That's where you want to measure a speaker or a subwoofer. And they'll play a sweep 
through that. So it's it's all the frequencies, <laughs> all the audible frequencies anyway, but they usually go from like 10 hertz up to like 30 kilohertz or something like that. In a subwoofer, obviously, you wouldn't play that high because it's no. never meant to play that high, but right. you might go from like 10 hertz to, 30, uh, to 300 hertz or something yeah. like that. But you'll play a sweep. And that sweep signal is all of those frequencies at the exact same volume level. That's what the signal is asking the thing to play. All of those frequencies, one after another, in a sweep, but all at the exact same volume level. Now you measure, what does the speaker or the subwoofer actually do in response to that signal? Now if it were perfect, you would see a flat line on your measurement. It would be right. all of these frequencies, played at the exact same volume level because that's what the signal asked me to do and that would be the measurement but no speakers over can actually do that across all of the audible frequencies so you'll see some squiggles and then at some point you'll see the graph like roll off right where it's just like you're asking me to play these lower and lower frequencies at the same volume as all the others but i just can't so they're quieter now and you see that graph roll off so we look at that and you'll see some squiggles up and down and we're hoping they stay within a range of plus or minus three decibels from the average, right? There'll be a straight line that you could draw through the middle of all those squiggles and a little bit, go a little bit above and a little bit below, but we're looking for a range plus or minus three decibels across that median line. And then you get down to the low frequencies and it starts to roll off. So we say, okay, how low can you go before you are three decibels quieter than that median line, and now everything below that is much quieter than that. Right. That is the minus three decibel or the negative three decibel point of that subwoofer or that speaker. That's how low it can play until it just starts to roll off. You get down to minus three dB, which like we say is still within that range that we're looking for, plus or minus three decibels. So we consider that flat response. We consider that accurate response to the signal. We give it some tolerance. We allow it to be three decibels quieter and we still consider that flat. But then everywhere below that, it's quieter than the signal ask it to play, and there's no way to make it louder. It's just that's the limit of the thing. Yeah, that's what it can do. So when when it when a subwoofer says, I can play down to twenty hertz or nineteen hertz plus or minus three decibels, it means they hopefully measured it outdoors and they got that graph and at 20 hertz or 19 hertz, it's three decibels quieter than median line, still within our tolerance range. And then everywhere below that, it's quieter than that. And there's no way to get it loud enough to equal what the signal was asking it to do. We say, okay, that's how low this subwoofer can accurately play all by itself, no help from the room, no help from equalization. That's its frequency range. Now, some manufacturers, we believe them when they give us that number, and some manufacturers, we don't. <laughs> and the reason is very simple. We, there are people out there that do the measurement the right way. The CEA, right. was it 20 something? 2010, yeah. There's a new name for it now, but we're used to calling it CEA yeah. 2010, and most places still list it as that. And basically, that's they take it outside. They yeah. put a microphone like two meters away. I think mm -hmm. is that what you're supposed to Yeah, you're to allowed do. to put it one meter away, but two meters yeah. is recommended. Yeah, two meters away from the front baffle of this the stri of, of the subwoofer and they play the sweep and they yep. measure it that is the accurate that is the the standardized way of measuring this so if you take an svs subwoofer and you take it outside and you do this measurement you're going to get a result that is very similar to what the claims are on yeah. the website. In fact, sometimes the claims on the website for SVS speakers, subwoofers, and uh, other manufacturers will be conservative. That's right. I mean, they'll say we play down to 20 hertz, but, you know, plus or minus 3 dB, but you take it outside and the, the person who's measuring is going, man, this thing went down to 18 hertz, no problem. That's right. So that's a conservative measurement. Therefore, and it has happened over and over right. again with SVS. There's a history of SVS giving us specs that bear out when third-party measurements happen. There are other manufacturers <laughs> who, when you take their subwoofers outside, you're like, nah, that's not even that's close. Right. And you're like, how yep. did they get that number? And it turns out they measured it with the subwoofer in a closet. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, and, I, and this happened, and I've, I've told us about uh, this this uh, on this story before on uh, the podcast a number of times, but LML Designs. That's right. You know, I, I measured their speaker. And, there, and I was like, man, this thing doesn't play anywhere. Because they were saying you know, it's a full range speaker. It plays down to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, nah, man, it barely gets down to 80 hertz. And it was a tower speaker. Mm -hmm. like, uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, how did you measure it? I'm like, well, I actually measured it in a room. But the room yeah. was like tons of acoustical absorption all over it. It sure. was back in Jacksonville where I had essentially like 
18 four inch panels you know in a 10 by 11 foot room it was just covered in panels and then i was one meter away and everything else and they're like oh yeah we measured it in the you know in our room in the corner yeah like yeah okay well then that makes sense why you got this weird result so uh you know or the the din when you see that din specification you're like din is okay because sure. because that that tells you uh, if you look up what does DIN mean and we talked about it last week and it's it is a standard it's like here's yeah. how you measure it and it's essentially the the negative ten decibel point right so again you're looking at that graph the signal set to play to all these frequencies at the same volume at right. some point it starts rolling off and they go all the way down to where the, where it's ten decibels quieter than what the signal asked it to play. And that's the figure they pick. For whatever reason, I'm not exactly sure why, but that's the figure they pick. Now, it's standardized, so you could measure every speaker and subwoofer that way, and then you could compare them. Apples right. to apples. We measured these all the same way, and here's the minus 10 decibel point of all of them. It's, I don't know how useful that is. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> nah. Yeah. You know, it's like saying the top speed of a, of a vehicle, but you measured the top speed as it was going, you know, down a very steep hill yeah, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> with a refrigerator full of, you know, <laughs> lead in the back seat. You know, it's like, yeah, OK, technically, if I throw it out of a plane, it can get this yeah. fast. I mean, but, I do kind you know, of know real where the world came from, which is like we mentioned last week. If you put that thing in a corner. You get about nine decibels of yeah. room bo- of boundary gain yeah. reinforcement. So I guess the idea is they think everything is going in a corner. So I don't, I, I don't know. It's a little bit weird, but that would be one of those frequency extension might be listed as a DIN specification. And now you know that means it was negative 10 decibels at that point. All right. Mwani on Twitter. Mwani has a JVC X770 770 projector in a room with full lighting light control. He'd like to get a new 120 inch screen fixed frame. What do we recommend and what gain should he get for the screen material? Well, if you're going to go with what we're going to recommend, you're not going to have very many options as far as gain because <laughs> yeah. it's, there's, I think there's one. <laughs> so you well, can, I suppose you, you could go for the gray or the silver or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're going to want to go to Amazon and pick up a silver ticket screen. Yeah. They're extremely inexpensive. They're very easy to put together. Uh, they're easy to hang. Yeah, I've, I, I've, I'm very happy with mine, and uh, and, and just their basic inch. white. <laughs> yeah, just whatever the white is. Yeah, Which, it's uh, probably gonna be like a 1.1, 1.2 or something. Yeah, like they that. call but it a really, 1.1 gain screen. Yeah, you really don't it. need in a light control room. You really don't need that much gain. Yeah, you know, generally speaking. So yeah, actually, just I mean, whatever they whatever they offer you, 120 inches with the X770. That's almost like a perfect pairing, even for yeah. HDR. Uh, you'd yeah. have to put it into the high lamp mode for HDR, but if you do, you'll get the full 100 nits at that screen size. 135 inches, you're pushing it. You probably wouldn't be able to hit a full 100 nits for HDR from that projector on 135, 150. You definitely can't, but 120 is like right in the butter zone. Uh, so you don't need additional gain from the screen. Uh, so yeah, the basic white silver ticket. I mean, that's all the way. Now there's a couple of things. What if he wants masking? We don't know for sure, but what if he did? Or what if he want? Well, he's fixed frame, so we know that. But what if he wants acoustically transparent? So, oh well, then yeah, yeah, then you got another it's a different. Yeah, <laughs> so Silver Ticket uh, does actually have a woven uh, acoustically transparent screen material. It's pretty good, um, but the weave on it is like there's enough of a texture. Because it is a it, it's a woven screen, so there's a bit of a texture, and there's there's holes in it, so the sound can come through. And by and large, I think you'd want to be about twelve, maybe thirteen feet away from that screen before you wouldn't see the weave and you wouldn't see the holes like ever. Uh, and so, if you were you know twelve or thirteen feet away from a hundred and twenty inch screen, you're now in a, like a forty degree field of view, which is still very nice. Uh, but I like a forty five degree field of view, so I'd want to be a little bit closer. I don't know what you would choose. So there are alternatives. Uh, so for masking or for acoustically transparent where you want to sit close, uh, that's where we'd recommend Seymour AV. Right. Uh, they're a lot more expensive though. They're a lot more expensive. They're very nice screens. Very, they're very, very nice good. screens. Yeah, it's uh, worth the money. Yeah. If But if you don't need it, then the silver ticket is the way to go. That's right. But we like Seymour because if you want masking, they actually have a manual masking system where there are magnets built into the frame and you physically go up there with a masking panel and it 
snaps into place with the magnets, yeah. uh, which is way less expensive than motorized masking, <laughs> like way less expensive than motorized masking. Now, they do have motorized masking as well, uh, which is less expensive than a lot of their competitors, but we're still talking in the four or $5,000 range now right. for motorized masking. And they have acoustically transparent fabrics where you can get like eight feet, definitely 10 feet, but uh, they have their ultra fine where you can get like eight feet away from it without seeing the weave or the holes. So options there, but more money. All right, Nick, this is going to be our last one. Okay. I'm gonna, I need to eat lunch. When it comes to soundproofing the basement, Nick thinks the stuff we've said about how to construct the floor and the walls makes sense, but you've heard us talk about drop tile or suspended ceilings many times, and that doesn't make any sense to him at all. Okay. We've talked about specialized ceiling tiles that have extra thickness and mass to them, but they'd be uh, in but they'd still be installed in a regular T-bar bar metal frame system, right? Mm -hmm. As such, there still there'd still be small gaps between each of the tiles and the flanking path created by the metal T-bars, wouldn't it there? Soundproofing company is 100% against drop tile ceilings, so how come we recommend them? Well, you're getting a little confused because we don't necessarily, we're, when we talk about drop tile ceilings, we're not talking about soundproofing. We may be talking about it at the same time, mm. But we're not always. Uh, well, I wouldn't blame Nick at all because I know the way I've phrased it. This would well, I, I'm not exactly I, I, like this. Yeah. yeah, but usually when we talk about when I'm talking about drop tile okay. ceilings, I'm talking about uh, absorption and ease of you know placing you know in uh, in ceiling speakers and all this other stuff. So you can put a ton of absorption above a drop tile ceiling right. to help with your. Uh, uh, Getting your getting the reflections down in your room, and it, you, it's easy to do in a way that's that you don't even see it. Mm -hmm. So with with doing that, you can then add just a couple of panels in the room at like the first reflection points, and you're pretty much done. You don't have to have a lot of this other uh, panels all around your room that some people find uh, visually mm -hmm. uh, irksome. Uh, but yeah, that's so. When I'm talking about drop tiles, I'm, I, I know that we talk about it at the same time yeah. as soundproofing, but it's not always a, you know, it's not like the component of the soundproofing uh, necessarily because you know the soundproofing comes from the decoupling, decoupling and, and and adding mass to the walls and the ceiling, uh, that you know the hat channels and all that other stuff. But you know the the drop tile, I, I you know I don't think that that necessarily is a soundproofing mechanism. It's just another way of adding absorption to your room. Mm. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll definitely say that I've, I've phrased it in a way where, where I, listening to myself, I would be like, yeah, he was talking about soundproofing, the actual yeah. like containment of sound in one room so that you don't hear it in another. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll try to go through a progression because, um, so if you talk to the folks over at soundproofingcompany.com, whom I love and I recommend all the time, but they are like, Here's the result we're going to rec or here's the construction we're going to recommend. And if you build it our way, you'll have a pretty darn soundproof room, <laughs> right. which is nobody can guarantee that you literally won't hear a peep, right? You play something at 120 decibels in your theater and you're right on the other side. You, you might hear a peep, but what they ha would have you construct is like, it's a soundproof room and they, they sweat the details and they're looking to have nobody ever come back to them and said, I spent all this money and did what you said, and it didn't work. Right. So you build it their way, it's going to work, and I stand behind that 100%. But building it their way <laughs> is difficult and expensive and takes up a fair amount of floor space, and not everybody wants, or drops your ceiling height, and not everybody wants to do that. And they're looking for something where they're like, I'm okay with hearing it a little bit, but I don't want it to be bad, right? And there right. are degrees in between. And since nobody's paying me for my advice and nobody's going to come looking for a refund, I, I'm willing to give in-between solutions. So let's say you're in a basement, you have no ceiling whatsoever, just the exposed floor ceiling joy uh, the, the joists that are holding up the floor above you. Of course, that's the worst it could possibly be, right? Sounds just going through there willy-nilly. Now, if you put up just one layer of drywall, that's your standard finishing, maybe you have some furring strips or something like that so that it's level, but you essentially have one layer of drywall, you know, uh, screwed directly to the, the floor joists that are above you. Uh, that gives you a little bit of soundproofing compared to the wide open floor joists, but very, very little. It's not terribly effective at blocking sound from getting upstairs. Uh, now you put some insulation, just your regular bad insulation above that one layer of drywall in between your floor joists. 
and it's a teeny bit better again, but really not very much. So where I talk about a drop tile ceiling in a basement uh, being somewhat of a sound, like an actual sound proofing, a sound isolation, is that it can be better than just a single layer of drywall attached to your floor joists. Now, probably not if you get the super cheap, like one sixteenth of an inch <laughs> tiles, because then you might as well just have a wide open floor joist situation again. Uh, but if you get a T-bar ceiling, uh, insulation above that, and you get the proper, fairly heavy, fairly thick, even with kind of a solid layer on top of them, uh, ceiling tiles that are labeled as soundproofing ceiling tiles, that is actually more effective in sound isolation than just one layer of drywall. So that's where I talk about that as a, a potential soundproofing sound isolation solution. Is it as good as what soundproofing company would have you build with sound clips and hat channels and two layers of drywall with green glue? Not even close, not right. even close to as good as that, but it's better than one layer of drywall. Why is it better? Well, the mass and the absorption, so the drywall has essentially no absorption to it, but you got insulation above it. You have the same insulation above it, so that's a wash with the proper ceiling tiles that have some thickness and some mass to them, those by themselves, even with the little gap that's in between there because of the T-bar ceiling, it's about as effective as the drywall all by itself. Those are about a wash. But now you have the decoupling of having that surface not in physical contact with the ceiling joists. Yeah, there's the T-bars holding them in there, but they're essentially decoupled. And that decoupling by itself makes it more effective than just one layer of drywall all by itself. So that's where that comes in. Uh, the next progression, of course, would be two layers of drywall with green glue, and then above that would be uh, decoupling the two layers of drywall with green glue. You get, I mean, that's way better than a suspended ceiling, but the suspended ceiling all by itself could be better than one layer of drywall, so that's why I've talked about that. Uh, the last part of it is we've sometimes recommended you actually do finish the ceiling like with drywall, as you would, and then put a suspended ceiling below that because you're equaling the height of some soffits or something like that. We talked about that just a couple of weeks ago, right? One guy was going to have a soffit on one end of his room, and we were like, finish it in drywall as normal, as a basement finisher normally would with different ceiling heights, the soffit being a bit lower, but then maybe consider putting a drop tile ceiling below the rest of the finished drywall ceiling. And once you have insulation and ceiling tiles above that, now that's better than just the one layer of drywall. So we've talked about soundproofing the ceiling uh, with a drop tile ceiling in that way as well. So I hope that clears it up. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. All right, uh, his last question. He'd like to get a set of full-sized over-the-ear sealed headphones to use at work, but he also like a very low low noise floor and clean amplification. He'd like to keep the total price under 200 bucks if possible. He was considering getting an AudioQuest Dragonfly USB DAC to handle the output from his computer and a pair of Sony uh, 7506 headphones that we've recommended in the past. Is that the very best option for him? He's concerned about comfort since he'll be wearing the headphones for several hours at a time. Will Will they get hot? Is there any such thing as sealed headphones that are somewhat breathable? No. <laughs> it's like, it, it, there is no such thing as breathable sealed headphones. Um, yeah, breathable kind of means they're, they're not sealed They're not sealed, anymore. yeah. Yeah. So how much does this Dragonfly thing cost? Cause, uh, okay, so there's the Dragonfly Black, which is about 100 bucks. So he has $100 for headphones. That's right. And you can that. get the 7506s off Amazon for usually 80 uh, at the most $90. So for $200 budget, you can, you can certainly get both of those. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I hate to... I'm just going to tell you straight up, man. I don't think that... I mean, I know that over-the-ear are... I mean, over-the-ear are more comfortable mm -hmm. than on-ear or in-ear. But, you know, I, I wear these headphones, which are, a, a, for me, over-ear. Okay. Uh, barely and at the end of a two-hour podcast i am a hundred percent ready to get these things off mm. my head so they are not particularly tight my uh, my open back ones are bigger and they're more comfortable but you know same sort of deal it, it's just after a couple hours you're going to want to take them off no matter what uh i mean yeah the, the 7506 is for three or four years running now have been the wire cutters top pick 
yeah. or an affordable pair of headphones. Like we've mentioned, and this is completely true still to this day, you go into almost any recording studio and they'll have probably several pairs of Sony 7506s. You, know, you watch the behind the scenes of anybody doing like uh, voice recording or something like that. They probably have a pair of 7506s yeah. on their head. Um, so those are, I mean, I, I think those are a really good choice for you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I have no problems with you doing that. If you could spend a little bit more, you might want to look at the Sennheiser Momentum series. Okay. Those are 250 by themselves right now mm. on Amazon, but I imagine they probably go on sale. There's also a, a version 2.0, so there may be a price drop at some point right. coming up. But uh, um, what I about, like those. What about the, uh, the Audio Technica's? Uh, the um, AT, uh, the ATH, 50s. Uh, M50s? M50s. Those are good, they, and they are bulletproof, man. Mm. Uh, those are like 100 and you, I think you can get them down like at 120 yeah. On sale, one fifty for sure, not more than that. One fifty for sure, but one hundred and twenty, I think, or twenty five is what I got them for. And I just sat there and, and basically checked Amazon every day until they, yeah. they were on sale. I mean, the, uh, the yeah, the HHM fifty, or I guess the M fifty X now. Yeah, um, no, no. I mean, they they list them as a hybrid design. They list them as like being sealed, but with some venting to them. But you you actually experienced them in person. Do you have any of that? I don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's I don't I mean, know what they're talking about. He's saying he wants to use them at work, so I'm assuming part of why he wants sealed is that he doesn't want other people hearing his music yeah. while he's at work, right? So yeah, you, you, you don't definitely really do want, want people sealed. to know that you like all that gangster rap stuff, man. Right. I mean, like I can tell you, yo, know, I've got some Sennheiser the uh, the HD five nine eights which are completely open back. So anything I'm playing, you can easily hear what I'm listening yeah. to if I have those on. Now, those are super comfortable and breathable, and I could wear them for hours and hours and hours and hours and never have a problem, but they're completely open back. Right. They're, they're not sound isolating at all. The so, M50s, I thought, were uh, are, a good, are a good headphone. They do start off a bit tight. And many of these mm. headphones are going to do that anyway, so you're going to... They're going to start off a bit tight, depending on the size of your head, too. So I, I, I think I have a pretty normal size head, but what do I know? I got a, so, I got a big old noggin, so. So the M50s, I think, would be a good choice as well. I could get behind that. Yeah. Uh, they are very, very rock solid as far as you know, good sound quality and good build quality. Those, you're going to have, those pads are going to go way, way, way before. And I've had those right. since, I mean, I had, I, I've had them since Dina. Yeah. And uh, they're still at my friend's house getting used right now. <laughs> I don't know why yeah, I haven't I mean, gotten those back. I need to get but those back. I, th I don't have a huge reason to steer you away from the Sony 7506s because they're they're less expensive. They sound great. You are at work, so the, the coiled cord that they come with isn't probably a problem. That's one little thing that they I don't They don't have a straight cord option anymore. They used uh, to. I have a straight cord option, but that cord is forever long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> it's you you're you're probably if you're gonna be sitting close to your source which it sounds like you're going to be yeah i'd definitely go with the coiled one because that yeah the straight cord dude is <laughs> like sit on the couch long <laughs> and i mean one of the reasons the wire cutter continually loves them is that they said like they have a, a fairly large panel of people who listen to all these headphones and everybody finds the 7506s pretty comfortable to wear right now for hours and hours on end they are sealed um they, they are gonna get hot i can't can't say they're not. I mean, that's just, but everything else is, the, the M50s are also going to get hot after that many hours. So, uh, yeah, that, you take them off every hour or so. Give yourself a little break and then you'll probably be fine. Now, does he need a USB DAC? Does he need a Dragonfly? Not for, the, uh, well, I mean, he wants low noise floor, right? I mean, I don't yeah. know what, what his headphone output is like. Yeah, I, I his... try them without first. That's what yeah, I, I think you get the headphones first. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking up. Uh, let me see, Doc. Let me see here. I think this is it. Uh, I'm looking up. There's another US. There's a lot of little USB things. A hundred bucks seems pricey to me. The Dragonfly is good though. I mean, as much it, as I do not like AudioQuest, talking about companies where like one bad product and we kind of like AudioQuest is the the uh, the inverse of that. Like a gazillion bad products that I hate, and then one product from them that I like, which is the Dragonfly. Yeah, so, but well, I like the DAC, the DAC Magic XS. Okay, uh, from Cambridge Audio. Oh, right, it's a right, right. Li little itty bitty device that has a very small little USB cord that you plug in there, and it has a headphone output and a volume control on it. Okay, and I like that one. It's seventy five dollars, so there's twenty five bucks you just hmm. saved right there. Okay, I, I think that one would be yeah. that would be good, and you could probably find that. I'm, I'm on the Cambridge Audio website, so it's probably at Amazon for less. So you know but, what? Uh, maybe maybe from Amazon you order the Sony's and the Audio Technicas. So get the M50Xs and the seventy five oh sixes. 
give them both a try. Send back the one you, you don't like. Keep the one you prefer. And then try them with your computer just all by itself. And if you're like, nope, not good enough, then then try one of the USB DACs. Yeah, but um, I wouldn't necessarily um, spend it all at once. Try and see if they have it. Man, dude, this doing research for this podcast just absolutely destroys what I've got on Amazon. Like, I got all kinds of weird <laughs> suggestions. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's still 74 bucks on here. The Audio Quest right. Dragonfly, I guess, is very, very small, too. So that's kind of nice. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's a USB dongle. It yeah. looks like a thumb drive, basically. It does. It looks exactly like a thumb drive. The deck magic yeah. is a little bit nicer, I think. But yeah. All righty. Okay, that's it. So what else we got, Rob? For yeah, this so uh, still on the list, we have Kevin, we have Ted M. Well, Ted, we know Ted. And uh, <laughs> he's not hes not talking about his uh, his uh, speakers in his tiny room, but he is still talking about legacy audio. So that All fun. right. Then. And we have uh, Bradford, who uh, signed up for Patreon. So Bradford's uh, question came in later in the week. You will be answered next week there, Bradford. All right. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We want to thank Iris for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation. Thank you very much, Iris. Yeah, Iris, thank you so much for that donation. We appreciate it. And it's impossible for me not to think of Iris from, uh, was it Flash? Oh, sure. Right, Iris West? Yes, Iris West. That she, it is impossible for me not to picture this person as that person. So you are... <laughs> <laughs> until until I know West. otherwise, you're Iris West. I'm sorry. I apologize. That that's what my brain does, but it does. I can't help it. Yeah, I don't know very many Irises in my life, and I don't know that one either. But she's the only one. Can... <laughs> so in my mind, that is the person who is asking us these questions. And we also want to thank our 72 patrons over at Patreon.com, including Bradford. Thank you guys. Yeah, that's Patreon.com/slash Avrant Podcast. If you would like to sign up, and thanks so much to our 72 patrons, Bradford. Thank you for being one of them. For A.V. Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.